Government of Western Australia. Department of Transport. Drive Safe. A Handbook for Western Australian Road Users. A message from the Chief Executive Officer, CEO, of the Department of Transport. This handbook is a comprehensive guide to the road rules that apply in Western Australia. It is written in an easy-to-understand format and designed primarily to help new drivers prepare for a lifetime of safe driving. If you are a new driver, this book contains the information you will need to obtain your learner's permit. The laws explained in this book are the major ones that are contained in the Road Traffic Code 2000 and Road Traffic Vehicles Regulations 2014. However, drivers should be familiar with all traffic laws and a copy of the relevant rules and regulations can be viewed on the internet at www.legislation.wa.gov.au or purchased from the state law publisher. To earn your driver's license will require a great deal of effort and, most importantly, many hours of practical experience driving with a supervisor. Those who have already obtained their license will still need to refer to this handbook regularly and to the Road Traffic Code 2000 to ensure that their understanding of the road rules is up to date. While a good knowledge of traffic laws will help you drive more safely, research shows that human behavior is a factor in over 90% of road crashes. So it is important that the theoretical knowledge of the correct use of our roads is translated into responsible and careful driving. The big killers continue to be speeding, drinking, and driving, failing to wear a seat belt, and driving when tired. Please take the time to learn the detailed information in this handbook, refer to it regularly, and put into practice the safe driving behavior that is the responsibility of us all. Chief Executive Officer Department of Transport A Handbook for Western Australian Road Users this handbook is a guide to safe driving and an interpretation of the law. It is not the law, but a simplified version of the road law as defined in the Road Traffic Administration Act 2008, including the Australian road rules that apply currently in Western Australia. It does not include all the traffic regulations and is not intended to be used as a legal document. More information can be obtained online at www.transport.wa.com gov.au slash dbs. Available online. This handbook can also be downloaded from our website. Visit www.transport.wa.gov.au slash dvs for the locations of our driver and vehicle services centers, regional dot centers, and agents. Unless otherwise stated, Driver and Vehicle Services, DVS, centers are open Monday to Friday, 8.15 a.m. to 4.30 p.m., excluding public holidays. Computerized Theory Tests, CTT, and Hazard Perception Tests, HPT, must be commenced before 3.45 p.m. at Department of Transport Centers. You may be eligible to book your Practical Driving Assessment, PDA, through your Duty Direct account. If you're an overseas license holder converting to a WA license, please call 1300-738-939 between 10 a.m. and 3 p.m. Monday to Friday to book a test. Revised edition date January 22, 2024. Prepared and published by Department of Transport, Driver, and Vehicle Services. Disclaimer. The information contained in this publication is provided in good faith and believed to be accurate at time of publication. The state shall in no way be liable for any loss sustained or incurred by anyone relying on the information. Page 93. Image of Fire Engine provided courtesy of Department of Fire and Emergency Services, DFS. Sign up to www.transport.wa.gov au slash dot direct. Have more time with your friends. Let us come to you anytime, anywhere. Visit the Duty Direct website and select the register button, then follow the steps. Once you enter your license details or your unique registration code, your personal details and username, you will receive a temporary password by email. The first time you log in, you will be required to create your own personalized password. Three. Contents. Part 1 Safe Driving 1. 1.1. The High Cost of Road Trauma. 2. 1.2. Speed. 2. 
1.2.1 Why is it more dangerous to drive fast? 3. 1.2.2 Choosing what speed to travel. 3. 1.3. Alcohol and drugs. 5. 1.3.1 The effects of alcohol on driving. 5. 1.3.2 Blood alcohol concentration, BAC. 5. 1.3.3 What is the legal limit? 6. 1.3.4 How much alcohol takes you over the legal limit? 7. 1.3.5 How long does alcohol stay in your body? 8. 1.3.6 Effect of alcohol and other drugs on driving. 8. 1.3.7 Random roadside drug and alcohol testing. 9. 1.3.8 What to do if you want to drink. 9. 1.4 Seat belts. 10. 1.4.1 How do seat belts work in a crash? 10. 1.4.2 Why you should wear a seat belt? 11. 1.4.3 Who does not have to wear a seat belt? 11. 1.4.4 Who must wear a seat belt? 12. 1.4.5 What if your passengers do not wear a seat belt? 14. 1.4.6. What is the correct way to wear a seatbelt? 14. 1.4.7. What should I do if my seatbelt is in poor condition? 14. 1.5. Driver. Fatigue. 15. 1.5.1. What is driver fatigue? 15. 1.5.2. The main causes of fatigue. 15. 1.5.3. What are the warning signs of driver fatigue? 17. 1.5.4. Ways to reduce driver fatigue. 17. 1.6. Anti-hoon legislation. 18. 1.7. Mobile phones. 18. 1.8. Other road users. 18. 1.8.1. Pedestrians. 18. 1.8.2 Parallel Walk Crossings 20. 1.8.3 Cyclists and Motorcyclists 21. 1.9 Motorcyclists 22. 1.9.1 Motorcycle Safety 22. 1.9.2 Ride to be seen by other road users 23. The 10 Rules to Safe Driving 25. Pre-Driving Checks 26. Part 2 How to Obtain a WA Driver's License 28 Getting Your Car C-Class License 29 The Graduated Driver Training and Licensing System 29 Getting a Motorcycle License 34 Getting a Heavy Vehicle License 35 Assessment for Heavy Vehicles 35 Seniors Assessments 35 Bribery 35 Organ Donation 36 the Importance of Organ Donation 36 Circumstances of Organ and Tissue Donation 36 Medical Procedures in Organ Donation 37 Becoming a Registered Organ Donor 37 Blood Donation 38 The Importance of Blood Donation 38 Are You Eligible? 38 Where to Give Blood 38 Part 3 Major Road Rules and Additional Safety Advice 39 Speed Limits 40 what are the speed limits? 40. Temporary speed limits 40. Passing incident response vehicles, emergency and breakdown vehicles 41. Two-way carriageway 42. Multi-lane carriageway 42. Roadwork sites 42. Temporary traffic control 43. Following distances 43. The two-second rule 43. How long does it take to stop your car? 44. How long does it take to stop a heavy vehicle 45? Driving in different conditions 45. Driving at night 45. Driving in fog or smoke 47. Driving in wet or hazardous weather 47. Country driving 48. Keeping to the left 48. Roads without marked lanes 48. Roads with two or more lanes 48. Railway crossings 49. When you must stop 49. When can you drive on 50? Buses and taxis 50. Crossing water on roadways 50. Traffic signs 51. 
Road markings 55. Traffic control signals 59. Intersection traffic control signals 59. Intersection traffic control arrow 60. Pelican signals 60. Officer directing traffic 61. Indicators and hand signals 61. When must you indicate slash signal? 61. Types of indicators slash signals 62. Indicators slash signals at roundabout 63. Freeway driving 65. Basic freeway rule 65. Entering a freeway 66. Appropriate speeds for freeway driving 66. Leaving the freeway 67. What you must not do on a freeway 67. Intersection 68. Controlled intersection 68. Uncontrolled intersection 69. Roundabout 70. Keep intersections clear 70. Turning 70. When to indicate slash signal your intention to turn. 70. Turning 71. U-turn 71. Turning at a multi-lane intersection 72. Changing lanes 72. Overtaking 73. When can you overtake? 73. When you must not overtake 73. How to overtake 74. What to do when you are being overtaken 74. Large and oversized vehicles 74. Stopping 76. Parking 77. Where you must not park 77. How to park 78. Clearway 79. Part 4 Emergencies and Incidents 80. For point 1. Motor Injury Insurance. 81. For point 1.1, 1. 1, what does your motor injury insurance cover? 81. For point 1.2, 1. 2, what is not covered by your motor injury insurance? 81. For point 1.3, 1. 1. cost of cover. 82. For point 2. How to handle emergencies. 83. For point 2.1, 2. breakdown on the road. 83. 4.2.2 tire blowout, rapid puncture. 84. 4.2.3 A stuck accelerator. 84. 4.2.4 brake failure. 84. 4.2.5 possible head on collision. 85. 4.2.6 forced onto the gravel. 85. 4.2.7 stalled on a railway crossing. 85. For point 2.8 bonnet flies up. 86. For point 2.9 shattered windscreen. 86. For 2. 10 car fire. 86. For 2. 11 skids. 87. For 2. 12 post crash management. 88. For point 3. First aid. 89. For point 3.1 point when the injured person is bleeding. 92. 4.3.2 Rest and reassure the injured person. 93. 4.3.3 Emergency vehicles. 93. 4.4 Contact with electrical infrastructure. 94. 4.5 Aggressive driving or behavior. 95. Part 5 The Law and U96. Change of address or name 97. Change of address 97. Change of name 97. Traffic infringement penalties 98. Demerit points 98. Demerit points scheme 98. Full license holders 98. Good behavior period 99. Graduated demerit point system. Novice drivers 100. Regulations for your car 102. Regulations for your motorcycle 104. Regulations for your trailer or caravan 105. Towing another vehicle 106. Horse and animal traffic 106. Part 6 cycle safe 107. Cyclists 108. Cyclists and the law 109. Cyclists safety 110. Equipment for your bicycle 110. Part 7 appendices 111. Appendix 1. Driver License Authorizations and Eligibility 112. Appendix 2. Driving in Western Australia whilst holding an interstate or overseas driver's license 115. Appendix 3. Getting your first license 117. Index 119. Part 1. 
Safe driving. The high cost of road trauma. Every death on our roads is a major tragedy causing enormous emotional pain and grief to family and friends. Even more distressing is the fact that many of those killed are young people. Statistics show that road users between 17 and 24 years of age make up just 15% of the Australian population, but they account for around one-third of road deaths. In Western Australia, 20% of drivers killed in road crashes are under 20 years of age, but this age group represents only 6% of all drivers. The major contributions to serious road trauma are speeding, alcohol, driving when tired, and the non-use of restraints. All these factors are within the control of the driver, which means that almost all road deaths and serious injuries can be prevented. Research also tells us that lack of driving experience is a major factor in crashes involving young people. That is why the process for obtaining a driving license has such a focus on practical experience. New drivers now spend more time driving under supervision and twice as long driving with the restricted requirements of P-plates than previously. They also have to successfully complete a hazard perception test. The loss of life and the cost to the community are unnecessary burdens that can be reduced with greater care and more responsible behavior by all drivers, both young and old. Speed. Speeding increases the risk of being involved in a crash and of being seriously injured or killed. Speeding is not just driving faster than the speed limit. It is also driving too fast to suit the road, traffic, visibility, or the weather conditions. It is against the law to drive above the posted speed limit. If you are caught speeding, you will be fined and you may accumulate demerit points. If you have a provisional license, you could have your license canceled. Under the anti-hoon legislation, people caught traveling at 45 kilometers per hour or more above the posted speed limit can be charged with reckless driving, resulting in license suspension or even cancellation. They can also have their vehicles impounded or confiscated if they are racing or doing burnouts. 2. Why is it more dangerous to drive fast? It is more dangerous to drive fast because injuries are more severe at high speed. You are more likely to be killed or kill someone else. It is harder to control a vehicle that is traveling at high speed. You have less time to react to hazards and other drivers have less time to avoid a collision with you. Always travel at a speed that allows you to anticipate and react safely to sudden dangerous situations that can occur on the road. Choosing what speed to travel. A speed limit is the maximum legal speed at which you can travel on a road under ideal conditions. You must adjust your speed to suit the conditions and remember never drive faster than the speed limit. The speed limit can be shown on signs or be the limit that applies to build up areas or the state's maximum speed limit depending on where you are driving. As a basic guide, you should drive slower when. Your speed helps determine how much time you have to react safely to a particular situation. The higher your speed, the less time you have to spot the hazard and react to it. Alcohol and drugs. If you drive after drinking alcohol or taking other drugs, you are more likely to be involved in a crash. Alcohol or drugs by themselves are dangerous, but the combined effect can be deadly. Enforcement of drink and drug driving saves lives. Remember that every police vehicle can undertake both roadside drug and drink driving tests and the probability that you will be randomly breath or saliva tested is high. Your driver's license is a valuable privilege. Don't risk your license, your life, or the lives of others by driving after you have consumed alcohol and or taken any drugs that may affect your driving. It is an offense to drive or attempt to drive while impaired by drugs. WA Police Force will issue drivers who test positive for certain prescribed illicit drugs or refuse a roadside drug test with a prohibition notice, which bans them from driving for 24 hours. The Effects of Alcohol on Driving Alcohol is absorbed quickly into the blood and travels rapidly to all parts of the body. It affects your brain's ability to make judgments and process information. It also impairs your consciousness and vision. No amount of coffee or soft drink will sober you up. Only time can do that. If you drink alcohol and drive, you will find it difficult to judge the speed of your vehicle. Judge the distance between your car and other cars. 
Notice traffic control signals, pedestrians, and other potential hazards. Concentrate on the task of driving. Keep your balance, especially on a motorcycle or on a bicycle or as a pedestrian, and stay awake when you are driving. Alcohol also gives you a false sense of confidence. You may take more risks than you would normally, but remember, alcohol slows down your reaction time to road hazards. Blood alcohol concentration, BAC. Blood alcohol concentration is the quantity of alcohol in the body. It is measured by the weight in grams of alcohol present in 100 milliliters of blood. A person's BAC can be determined by analyzing a blood, breath, or urine sample. As soon as you start drinking, your BAC begins to rise and could take up to two hours to reach its highest concentration, especially if you have eaten a substantial meal at the same time. Even though you may not have had a drink for an hour or more, your BAC may still be rising. What is the legal limit? The amount of alcohol you are allowed to have in your body when you are driving will depend upon the type of vehicles you are authorized to drive and the current status of your license. The following information sets out the various BAC limits and when they apply. Drivers and riders should be aware these penalties may change from time to time. Zero BAC applies to Novice drivers. A person is a novice driver until they have held a license for minimum two years or periods adding up to two years. Drivers of hire and reward vehicles asterisk. Drivers of passenger vehicles with capacity to carry more than 12 adult passengers asterisk. Drivers of certain heavy vehicles, asterisk. Drivers of vehicles carrying dangerous goods, asterisk. Extraordinary license holders and recently disqualified drivers. Asterisk the zero BAC limit for certain drivers may not apply at all times. Please visit www.transportwa.gov.au au slash dvs for further information on when a driver must have a BAC limit of zero. 0. 0.05 BAC applies to all other drivers. How much alcohol takes you over the legal limit? 0% BAC. You must not drink any alcoholic drinks at all if you intend to drive. 0.02% BAC. To be sure that you do not reach 0.02%, you should not drink any alcoholic drinks at all when you intend to drive. 0.05% BAC. Back levels vary from person to person. The amount of alcohol you can consume before reaching the legal limit depends on factors such as your size and fitness level. If you are unfit or of small build, it may take you less than the standard number of drinks to exceed the legal limit. Your gender. Alcohol is soluble in water. Men's bodies generally have a higher proportion of water than women's. Therefore, consuming the same amount of alcohol will usually cause a higher BAC in a woman than a man of a similar size. The amount of alcohol still in your blood from drinking the night before or earlier in the day. If you still have traces of alcohol in your blood, your BAC will be higher than normal after one standard drink and the amount of food in your stomach. Food slows down the absorption of alcohol. If you have not eaten a substantial meal before drinking alcohol, your BAC may reach the legal limit more quickly than if you have had something substantial to eat. What is a standard drink? Any drink containing 10 grams of alcohol is called a standard drink. One standard drink will raise an average person's BAC by about 0.01% grams of alcohol per 100 milliliters of blood, depending upon the factors mentioned. A measurement of 0.05% BAC means that your body contains 50 milligrams of alcohol per 100 milliliters of blood. The Department of Health advises that to stay below 0.05% BAC. An average-sized, healthy woman should have no more than one standard drink in the first hour of drinking and then no more than one standard drink per hour after. That and... An average-sized, healthy man should have no more than two standard drinks in the first hour of drinking, then no more than one standard drink per hour after that. How long does alcohol stay in your body? The body breaks down alcohol very slowly. A healthy person will take about one hour to get rid of the alcohol from one standard drink. 
So, if you have four standard drinks in an hour, it will take about four hours to get it all out of your system. Remember, no amount of coffee or soft drink will speed up the breakdown of alcohol in your body. To ensure you stay below 0.05% BAC, limit your drinking to one standard alcoholic drink per hour. The Department of Health recommends that, for the sake of your health, you should limit your alcohol intake to four standard drinks a day if you are a man and two standard drinks a day if you are a woman. Always follow these three rules when drinking alcohol. Limit yourself to one standard drink per hour. Drink plenty of water and other non-alcoholic drinks. And eat something substantial while drinking. Effect of alcohol and other drugs on driving. Many prescribed and non-prescribed drugs and medicines can seriously affect your driving ability. Drugs such as sedatives or tranquilizers may impair your concentration, make you drowsy, and slow down your reaction time. Medications for the common cold or travel sickness can have the same effect. These side effects may last several hours. If you are taking any drugs or medications, check with your doctor or chemist about the effect they may have on your driving ability. Never combine alcohol and drugs. The effects of alcohol and drugs vary and can become much stronger when they are used in combination. This can be very dangerous and even deadly. Random Roadside Drug and Alcohol Testing Drink and drug driving is a major contributor to road fatalities in Western Australia. Many drivers appear unaware of the effects that alcohol and drugs can have on their alertness, vigilance, and ability to react rapidly to unexpected road hazards. Some drugs can also increase the impairing effects of alcohol and fatigue. Police may stop motorists and require them to take a random drug or alcohol test to detect the presence of prescribed illicit drugs or alcohol. It is a serious offense to refuse a random breath test or a request to give a saliva sample for drug testing. What to do if you want to drink? Don't drink and then drive. If you want to drink, plan ahead. Your options include Arranging a lift with a friend who isn't drinking Arranging to stay the night after a party Hiring a minibus if it is for a group Appointing a skipper Using public transport phoning someone to come and collect you, or taking a taxi. One way to avoid drinking too much alcohol is to alternate your alcoholic drinks with water, non-alcoholic or low-alcohol drinks. Do not get involved in shouts, requiring you to buy rounds of drinks. Don't drive with a BAC greater than the legal limit. In doing so, you face an increased risk that you will lose your life or cause others to lose their lives. Injure yourself or someone else. Be charged by the police. Lose your license. Be fined or imprisoned. Have your vehicle confiscated or damage your car or someone else's property. If you have a crash while you are over the BAC level or you are impaired by drugs, you will not be covered by insurance. Seat belts. Seat belts save lives. Always wear one. How do seat belts work in a crash? There are two types of collision in any road crash. If you are not restrained by a seat belt, you will keep moving inside the car if it comes to a sudden stop. If you are traveling at 100 kilometers per hour on impact, your body will still be moving at that speed after the collision. If you are not wearing a seat belt, you will hit some part of the car or the other people in the car. The higher the speed, the greater the force with which you will be thrown around inside the car or out of the car. It is the human collision that injures and kills people. Seat belts can help prevent injury and death. Why you should wear a seat belt seat belts prevent the human collision. Wearing a seat belt will protect you from being thrown about in the driver slash passenger compartment, hitting parts of the car, other occupants, or being thrown from the vehicle. Good drivers have crashes too. Although some people are safer drivers than others, all drivers run the risk of being involved in a crash. People who drink, drive fast, are tired, discourteous, or inexperienced have a higher risk of having a crash. You never know when you may encounter a dangerous or careless driver, so don't take a chance. Always wear your seat belt. People are rarely trapped because of seat belts. Some people are afraid that they will be trapped in the car if they are wearing a seat belt and their car catches fire or falls into water after a crash. Statistics show that it is very rare for this to happen. 
Wearing a seatbelt will increase your chances of being alive and conscious after a crash so that you can escape from the fire or water. Seatbelts save us money. We all pay the costs of hospital and medical treatment, legal costs, invalid pensions, and higher insurance rates in one way or another. Preventing injuries to yourself and to others by wearing a seatbelt is in everyone's best interest. Who does not have to wear a seatbelt? Legally, you do not have to wear a seatbelt if you are. The driver of a vehicle traveling in reverse. In possession of a current medical certificate authorizing exemption. Doing work which requires getting in and out of the vehicle frequently, and the vehicle does not travel faster than 25 kilometers per hour. Under the age of 12 months and in a taxi, if there is no suitable child restraint available, provided they are not in the front row of seats where there are two or more rows of seats, or a taxi driver carrying passengers after dark, 10x, 34, 23%. You are 10 times more likely to be killed in a road crash if you're not wearing a seat belt in a car. On average, 34 people are killed in road crashes in W each year while not wearing a seat belt. Of regional road fatalities in 2016 were not wearing seat belts. Information courtesy of Road Safety Commission. Who must wear a seat belt? The driver and each passenger must be appropriately restrained and in a seated position in the vehicle. Seat belts are designed to be used by only one person at a time. Doubling up, fastening a seat belt around two people is both illegal and unsafe. Seat belts work just as well in the back seat. You must wear a seat belt when sitting in the back seat. If you don't and the vehicle you are traveling in is involved in a crash, you may hit some part of the vehicle or other people in the car. Seat belts must be worn on short as well as long trips. Many crashes occur within a close distance to the driver's home. Even if you are just going to the local shops, you must wear your seat belt. Seat belts must be worn by pregnant women. Seat belts must be worn by pregnant women unless they have a current medical certificate exempting them from this requirement. A seat belt worn correctly across the hips, below the baby, is unlikely to cut into the unborn child. The baby is much more likely to be injured in a crash if the mother is not wearing a seat belt. Child Car Restraint Law Children need protection too. Children and babies who are not restrained can be injured when the driver has to brake hard. An adult's lap is not safe enough for a child when there is a crash. Even if the child is small, an adult will not be able to hold onto the child in the event of a crash. Western Australia has introduced national child car restraint laws to keep children safe and protect them in vehicles. Traffic penalties and fines will apply to the driver of the vehicle if children are not restrained in accordance with child car restraint laws. Child car restraint laws will affect you if you are carrying passengers under the age of 7 years. Children under 7 years of age must wear a suitable child restraint. Child car restraint laws also specify where children are permitted to sit in a vehicle. A vehicle which has two or more rows of seats, children aged under seven must be seated in the rear seats of the vehicle and suitably restrained. Children four to less than seven years old are not permitted in the front seats of a vehicle unless all rear seats are occupied by children less than seven years of age and must be suitably restrained. Children aged 7 years and over can sit in any seating position provided they are suitably restrained. If there is a passenger airbag in the front seating position occupied by a child, it is recommended that the seat is moved as far back as possible while still allowing correct restraint and seat belt fit. Children who are outside weight slash size guidelines for existing restraints will be able to use the restraint type for the next age group. Before you purchase or install a child restraint, you must ensure it complies with Australian standards. Further information on child restraint laws, including exemptions from these laws, can be located online at www.childcarrestraints.com, AU, or by phoning the Roadwise Child Restraint Information Line on 1300-780-713. Never ride in the back of a utility, panel van, or station wagon. It is illegal to ride in the back of a utility or other open-load space. 
If you are traveling in the open load space of a utility or in the back of a panel van or a station wagon, you face a greater risk of serious injury or death, particularly if there is a crash or if you fall out of the vehicle. Carrying passengers in the tray of a utility, truck, or other vehicle that is fitted with an approved rollover protection device has not been legally permitted since December 31, 2005. And it is illegal to carry any passengers in the tray of utilities or open load space of any vehicle, even if it has a rollover protection device fitted. What if your passengers do not wear a seatbelt? Under the Road Traffic Code 2000, the driver must ensure that each passenger in or on the vehicle who has reached the age of 16 years complies with regulations. Drivers are legally responsible for ensuring that children up to the age of 16 are suitably restrained in a vehicle. If a child under the age of 7 years is a passenger in your vehicle, you are responsible for ensuring the child is wearing a suitable child restraint and the restraint is properly adjusted and securely fastened. Only passengers that are sitting in a seat that is fitted with a seat belt or child restraint suitably fastened can be carried in the vehicle. Some exceptions do apply for passengers aged 7 years and over where the vehicle is not required by law to have seat belts fitted. No additional unrestrained passengers are permitted and passengers cannot share the same seat or seat belt. The legislation can be viewed online at www.legislation wa.gov.au or purchased from the state law publisher. What is the correct way to wear a seat belt? A seat belt is legally required to be properly adjusted and securely fastened. Your seat belt should be tight but comfortable. The buckle should be at your side and there should be no twists or knots in the straps. Properly working retractable seat belts will self-adjust. What should I do if my seat belt is in poor condition? It is illegal and unsafe to have a worn, frayed, faded, or damaged seat belt. You must have it replaced. Driver fatigue. Driver fatigue, driving when you are tired, is a major road safety hazard. Fatigue-related crashes tend to be severe because sleepy drivers don't take evasive action. The risk of serious injury to a driver, passengers, or the occupants of other vehicles in this type of crash is very high. What is driver fatigue? Fatigue is a common term that refers to mental and physical tiredness. Fatigue causes loss of alertness, drowsiness, poor judgment, slower reactions, reduced driving skill, and may cause you to fall asleep at the wheel. If you are a driver and you become drowsy, you can drift into microsleep, which is a brief nap that lasts for around 3 to 5 seconds. At 100 kilometers per hour, your vehicle can travel over 100 meters in that time, which is enough time for it to run off the road into a tree, another vehicle, or a pedestrian. The main causes of fatigue body clock factors. Your body runs on a natural biological cycle of 24 to 26 hours, often called your body clock. Your body clock programs you to sleep at night and to stay awake during the day. Your body clock is controlled partly by light and dark and partly by what you do. If you normally work from 9 a.m. to 5 p.m., some of the things that happen to you as a result of your body clock are The morning light tells your body clock to make you more alert, wakes you up. During the morning, your body clock keeps you alert. After lunch, your body clock will turn your alertness down for a couple of hours. Your body clock will make you most alert and aware in the late afternoon and early evening. Darkness in the evening tells your body clock to turn your alertness down again so you can get ready to sleep and to stay awake during the day. After midnight, your body clock will turn your alertness right down so that you are switched off between 2 a.m. and 6 a.m. At this time, all your body functions are at their lowest level. What all this means for you as a driver is that you will usually be at your best, most alert, and safest when driving during the morning, the late afternoon, and early evening. You will usually be at your worst between midnight and 6 a.m. when the body clock turns your alertness down. This is a dangerous time for drivers. Information from road crashes shows this is true. Although there are fewer drivers on the road between midnight and 6 a.m., statistics show they can be up to 20 times more likely to have a crash during those hours. Sleep factors and fatigue, and that is to get enough sleep. There is only one way to prevent fatigue, and that is to get enough sleep. 
Seven and a half hours sleep is generally recognized as an average and normal need. If you get much less than this, you will suffer fatigue. You will feel tired during the day, but you will feel much worse at night when your body clock turns your alertness down. You will also be a danger to yourself and others on the road. If you have not had any sleep for 17 to 18 hours, your ability to drive will be the same as if you had a BAC of 0.05%. Not only is that way over the 0% BAC limit for a novice driver, but it also means your crash risk doubles. You may like to go out at night and stay out until the early hours of the morning. Just be aware that if you drive when you have not had enough sleep, you are taking a big risk. If you crash because you are not alert, you are likely to be held responsible. Work factors. Long working hours or study hours or physically tiring work can affect your ability to drive. If you are a shift worker, then you need to take extra care. Research shows that shift workers are six times more likely to be involved in fatigue-related road crashes than other workers. You can drift in and out of sleep without knowing it. Sleep experts call this a micro sleep, and it can last between three and five seconds. These naps can be fatal and are the main cause of fatigue-related crashes where the driver runs off the road. These crashes are usually the most serious because the driver doesn't break before hitting a tree, another car, or the gravel. 27. 25. 6 hours. Fatal crashes in 2016 were fatigue-related. People received critical injuries in fatigue-related crashes in 2016. Of sleep per night is the minimum recommended. To avoid fatigued driving. Information courtesy of Road Safety Commission. Health factors. There are a number of medical factors that can prevent you from getting the long periods of sleep that you need to feel refreshed and alert. If you had enough sleep during the night, but you still feel tired and drowsy during the day, you should consult your doctor. Look after your health and fitness. The healthier and fitter you are, the better you will sleep and the more alert you will be when driving. Don't take stimulant drugs to keep you awake. These only delay sleep. When they wear off, there can be a sudden onset of sleepiness, which is very dangerous, especially if you are driving. What are the warning signs of driver fatigue? There are a number of warning signs to indicate that you are becoming too tired to drive safely. Some of the warning signs are, you keep yawning, your eyes feel sore or heavy, you start daydreaming and not concentrating on your driving, your vehicle wanders over the road, you start hallucinating, your reactions seem slow, or your driving speed increases or decreases unintentionally. Be honest with yourself. If you have any of these warning signs while you are driving, stop immediately and take a break. Ways to reduce driver fatigue. Here are some tips to help you keep alert at the wheel. Get plenty of sleep before you start driving on long trips. Provide adequate time for sleep, rest, and food during long trips. Take regular breaks, at least every two hours, to walk and have a stretch. Get fresh air into your vehicle. Smoke and stale air can contribute to drowsiness. And learn to recognize the signs of sleepiness and pull over as soon as possible for a short break. Once fatigue sets in, there is nothing you can do about it except stop immediately and take a break or a nap. Anti-Hoon Legislation Under Anti-hoon legislation, drivers and motorcyclists who endanger lives through reckless behavior can have their vehicles impounded or confiscated. People caught racing or doing burnouts can lose their vehicles for 48 hours. If a second offense occurs, the vehicle can be impounded for up to three months and their driver's license suspended. On a third offense, the vehicle can be confiscated altogether and the driver's license permanently disqualified. Mobile phones. A mobile phone may only be used by the driver of a motor vehicle to make or receive a phone call while driving if the phone is either secured in a mounting affixed to the vehicle or, if not secured, can be operated without touching it, voice activated. It is illegal to create, send, or look at a text message, video message, email, or similar communication while driving. The GPS function of a mobile phone may be used by a driver while driving as long as the phone is secured in a mounting, and the driver does not need to touch the phone, including the keypad or screen, at any time. Other road users. Pedestrians. 
Always keep a lookout for pedestrians and be ready to stop for them. Some of the places to look out for pedestrians are at pedestrian crossings, intersections, between parked cars or behind buses, near schools and playgrounds, near shopping centers, and near hotels, taverns, or clubs where people have been drinking alcohol. Drivers and riders must give way to pedestrians, including people in wheelchairs, who are crossing at an intersection in front of your turning vehicle, or crossing at a pedestrian crossing, zebra, or children's crossing, or crossing at a marked foot crossing, traffic signal controlled crossing for vehicles and pedestrian lights for pedestrians when a light facing vehicles is flashing yellow, or red, or Crossing in front of your vehicle at a slip lane, a left turn lane at an intersection where there is an island between that lane and lanes for other traffic. Parallel walk crossings. These are intersections controlled by traffic signals for vehicles and pedestrian lights for pedestrians to use to cross the road. Parallel walk crossings are those where pedestrians are permitted to walk on the green pedestrian signal parallel with the flow of traffic. At these crossings, the lights for pedestrians turn green a few seconds before drivers are given their green light to proceed and turning vehicles must give way to pedestrians crossing with the pedestrian lights. Cyclists and motorcyclists. Cyclists and motorcyclists have an equal right to use the road as other vehicles. Share the road with them and allow them plenty of room. Be courteous and take extra care when there are riders on the road by. Cyclists may legally use the whole lane on roads with lane markings. They are allowed to ride two abreast, side by side. Motorcyclists. Being smaller than other vehicles, motorcycles are sometimes not easily seen. In addition to the road rules that apply to all road users, there are special rules to help protect motorcyclists. Motorcycle safety. The risk of being killed or injured on a motorcycle is far greater than in a car. All motorcyclists and their passengers must wear an approved safety helmet. If you do not wear one, you will be fined and incur demerit points. In the interest of safety, a motorcyclist should also wear protective clothing. To reduce the risk of sustaining severe injuries, you should always wear protective clothing as shown in the diagram. The minimum clothes you should wear include closed shoes, not sandals or thongs, etc., long pants and a jacket, as well as a helmet. You must wear appropriate protective clothing for your practical riding assessment. Gloves and eye protection are highly recommended. Many lightweight items now available will protect you just as well as heavier clothing. Take extra care when you carry a passenger. You may carry one passenger on your motorcycle provided you have a pillion seat and separate footrests. The passenger must wear an approved helmet, sit behind the rider, face forward, and have both feet on the footrests at all times. If the passenger cannot reach footrests, they are not allowed to be carried. The rider of a motorcycle shall not ride on a road with a passenger who has not attained eight years of age unless the passenger is in a sidecar. Carrying a passenger adds weight to the motorcycle, making it slower to respond. Adjust your riding techniques to allow for the extra weight. Your passenger should also wear appropriate protective clothing. Talk to your passenger as little as possible as it can distract you and increase your reaction time to hazards on the road. Ride to be seen by other road users. Smaller vehicles such as motorcycles appear further away and seem to be traveling slower than they actually are. Here are some ways that you can assist other road users to notice you. Turn on your headlights at all times. Oncoming traffic will be able to see you much more easily. Be ready to use your horn when passing another vehicle or whenever you are unsure if a driver is aware of your presence. Flashing indicators or hand signals make you more visible. Always use them. When turning, diverging, or changing lanes, Indicate slash signal for sufficient time to warn other drivers and pedestrians of the direction you are taking. Glance over your shoulder as well as checking your mirror. It is the only way to make certain there is no traffic behind you in your blind spots. Use your mirrors frequently to check the traffic situation behind you. Always look well ahead and always practice correct braking techniques. 
It is wise to make a habit of using your motorcycle's front and rear brakes every time you slow down or stop. You will need to use both front and rear brakes in an emergency stop. To ensure that you develop the habit and skill of using them together, you should use both brakes for all stops. Apply both brakes gently but firmly. Squeeze the front brake and press down on the rear brake. Do not grab at the front brake or jam your foot down on the rear brake. This can cause the brakes to lock, resulting in serious control problems. Always reduce your speed before entering a bend or making a turn. If you enter a bend or turn too quickly, you may lose control of your motorcycle. The 10 Rules to Safe Driving Road safety experts believe that if every driver followed these 10 rules to safe driving, the road trauma rate would be dramatically reduced. The 10 rules to safe driving are Drive at a safe speed Don't drink and drive Obey the road rules Concentrate at all times and be prepared. Be patient and, when in doubt, don't proceed. Plan your moves well in advance. Give correct signals. Be alert particularly at intersections. Know your vehicle and be polite and considerate toward other road users. Pre-driving checks. Is your car in safe working order? Before you drive, take some time to check that your car is safe to be on the road. Some of the things you should look at are tires. Tire tread should be at least 1.5 millimeters deep, about the thickness of a match head, over all parts of the tire surface that normally comes in contact with the road. Smooth tires can cause you to skid, and they can be very dangerous in wet conditions. Tires should be inflated to the vehicle manufacturer's specifications. This is particularly important when you are driving long distances or when you are carrying a full load. Check the tire pressure when your tires are cold. Brakes. Have your brakes checked regularly by a qualified person. Faulty brakes will significantly increase your stopping distance. Steering. Ensure that your steering assembly is in good condition because faulty steering can cause your car to wander on the road. Lights. Make sure that all lights, including headlights, brake lights, indicator lights, and parking lights are operating correctly. If your lights are not working properly, other drivers may not be able to see you or may not understand your intentions. Horn. Only use your horn to warn other road users of danger. It is an offense to use it for other purposes. Windscreen and windscreen wipers. A dirty windscreen is dangerous. It is easier to see through a clean windscreen, especially when driving into the sun, at night, or in the rain. You should replace faulty or damaged windscreen wipers because they prevent you from seeing clearly when it is raining. And mirrors. You are legally required to have mirrors on your car, and it is illegal to have anything hanging from it. Even with mirrors, your car has blind spots or areas you can't see without looking over your shoulder. Other cars, and especially motorcycles and bicycles, can be completely hidden in your blind spots. Make sure that your interior and exterior rearview mirrors are correctly adjusted. These mirrors are intended to help you see what is on the road next to you and behind you. You should do this adjustment when you are in the correct driving position. The following are tips for adjusting your mirrors. 27. Part 2. How to Obtain a WA Driver's License Western Australia has a graduated licensing system for new drivers. This means that novice drivers must complete a number of assessments and gain experience in different driving conditions before being granted a provisional driver's license. A graduated system also applies to drivers obtaining motorcycle or heavy vehicle licenses. Full details of experience requirements for motorcycle or heavy vehicle licenses are at Appendix 1. Getting your car C-Class license. Before you can learn to drive any motor vehicle on the road, you must have a valid learner's permit. A learner's permit allows you to drive a vehicle of the specified class. The minimum age at which a person can obtain a learner's permit to drive, see class vehicles, is 16 years of age. Learner's permits are valid for a period of three years. You may apply for a learner's permit at any driver and vehicle services, DVS, center or regional DVS agent. When applying for a learner's permit for the first time, you must provide evidence of your age, identity, and where you live. 
The forms of identification you will need to take with you when applying for your learner's permit can be found at Appendix 3. When you apply for a learner's permit, you will be charged a fee to undertake a theory test on the road rules. You will also be charged an application fee that entitles you to undertake one practical on-road driving assessment. To start recording your supervised driving hours you will need to pay for and be issued a learner log book or elect to use the logbook app Learn and Log, which is available for free from the App Store and Google Play. You must hold a Duty Direct account to access the app. The Graduated Driver Training and Licensing System The Graduated Driver Training and Licensing System is designed to make sure learner drivers get a wider range of supervised driving experience under different road and traffic conditions over a longer period before driving solo. The system is designed to help you acquire the practical driving skills, good driving habits, and the responsible and courteous attitudes that are essential to safety on our roads. Learner drivers aged 25 and above who are applying for a car C-class license are exempt from the requirement to complete a logbook. The six steps to a provisional license. Step one, learner's permit. Before you can learn to drive, you will have to pay for and pass a computerized theory test. The computerized test consists of multiple choice questions on the road rules and safe driving practices. You need to read this book beforehand, as the information will help you to answer the test questions. You can also practice the learner's test online at www.transport.wa.gov.au slash dvs to help you pass the test. Select a logbook, paper or electronic, unless exempt. If you pass the theory test, you need to pay for and be issued a logbook or elect to use the logbook app Learn and Log, which is available for free from the App Store and Google Play. Hours can be recorded in the printed logbook, the app, or a combination of both. Pass an eyesight test. If you need glasses or contact lenses to pass the test, your permit and license will be endorsed to show that these must be worn when you drive. Pass a medical test if required. If you have a medical condition and or take medication, you must declare this on the application form when you apply for a driver's license. The customer service officer will advise whether or not you will need to have a medical assessment before you can obtain a learner's permit and pay application fee. Once all of the above requirements have been met, you must pay an application fee to be issued with a learner's permit. The application fee paid will include one practical driving assessment entitlement. Step two, start to learn to drive. Once you have your learner's permit and an approved logbook, you can begin learning to drive with a supervising driver. You must complete and record a minimum of 50 hours, including a minimum of five hours at night, supervised driving experience prior to being eligible to sit a practical driving assessment. The person who teaches you to drive can be a person who holds an instructor's license issued under the Motor Vehicle Drivers Instructors Act 1963, or a person who is an instructor in a youth driver education course conducted or supervised by a body authorized by the Department of Transport for that purpose, or a person who is authorized, licensed driver, to perform any driving of a kind for which the driving instruction is to be given asterisk and has had that authorization for a period of, or periods adding up to, at least two years, in the case of driving of a moped, or at least four years in any other case. Asterisk this means that a person who is authorized to drive a C-class vehicle within a condition, automatic vehicle, cannot supervise a learner driver in a manual vehicle. If your instructor has an automatic transmission condition on their license, they can only supervise you in an automatic vehicle. You must display L plates on the front and rear of the vehicle when you are driving. The highest speed allowable for learner drivers is 100 kilometers per hour. Learner drivers are not allowed to drive within the boundaries of Kings Park or wherever signs prohibit learner drivers. Learner drivers must not drive if they have a blood alcohol concentration greater than 0%. To help you learn to drive and pass the practical driving assessment, you should read the Driving Techniques for Safer Drivers book, which is available from all DVS centers and regional agents or online at www.transport.wa.gov.au slash dvs. Step 3. 
Hazard Perception Test, HPT. Once a minimum of six calendar months has lapsed from the issue date of your learner's permit, and you have reached the minimum age of 16 years and six months, you can sit your HPT. The test includes a series of moving traffic scenes. You must respond to each scene by clicking a mouse to indicate when it is safe to commence a maneuver or when it is necessary to take the appropriate action to reduce the risk of a crash for the traffic situation. The computer recorded response time, or lack of response from you, will then be compared to the recommended response, or no response, times required to pass the test. You can sit the HPT at any DVS center, regional department of transport office or agent. You do not need to make an appointment. You will be charged a fee prior to sitting the HPT. Step four, continue to gain experience. Once you pass your HPT, you need to build on your experience and continue to record a minimum of 50 supervised driving hours, including at least five hours at night between sunset and sunrise. Research indicates that young novice drivers who gain at least 100 to 120 hours of supervised driving experience are better prepared for a lifetime of safe driving and are less likely to be involved in serious crashes. During this stage, you must still display L plates and drive within any of the conditions printed on your permit. You should get as much supervised driving experience in as many different road, weather, and traffic conditions as you can. This will better prepare you for when you can drive unsupervised and will help you pass the practical driving assessment. It is recommended that your supervised driving experience includes driving on freeways, highways, and or major roads, driving at nighttime, and driving at speeds between 80 km per hour and 100 km per hour on permitted roads. You should also try some of the practice exercises in the driving techniques for Safer Drivers book. Only driving sessions that are properly recorded in an approved logbook will be credited. You will not be given any credit for supervised driving that is not substantiated and detailed in an approved logbook. If your printed logbook is lost, destroyed, or misplaced, and you do not wish to use the Learn and Log app to record your supervised driving hours, you will need to pay for a new printed logbook. Any Previous supervised driving experience will not be credited. The logbook, including the Learn and Log app, is a legal document and false or misleading information will cause those that have signed these documents to be liable to prosecution. Step 5. Practical Driving Assessment, PDA. When you have developed the ability to control a vehicle safely, completed a minimum of 50 hours, including a minimum of five supervised nighttime driving hours of supervised driving experience. And if you are at least 17 years old, you can book and sit a PDA. Online PDA bookings can be made for tests conducted at most DVS centers and agent locations. Visit www.transport.wa.gov. AU slash DVS or call 131156 and have your learner's permit number on hand. The assessment looks at the quality of your driving rather than the way you perform individual skills. When a learner driver shows signs of quality driving, it generally means that they have had plenty of practice and have encountered many different driving experiences. So, to be ready to go for your PDA, you will need to be able to handle many different situations without relying on your supervisor's help. If you don't pass the PDA, you will have to pay another fee to take the PDA again. It is in your interest to make sure you have enough experience before you make your appointment. If you wish to change or cancel an appointment, you must give more than two full working days notice. Otherwise, you will forfeit your PDA entitlement and have to pay for another one. To cancel or change an appointment for a PDA, please change your online PDA booking at www.transport.wag.gov. AU slash DVS or phone 13 11 56. On the day of your PDA, arrive at least 10 minutes before the appointed PDA time. Provide a roadworthy vehicle of the correct class for your PDA. C-class vehicles must have a centrally mounted park brake. As soon as you arrive, inform the staff that you have an appointment to sit a PDA. If you have used the printed logbook to record any hours, you must bring it with you. The assessor will check that you have completed the minimum 50 hours, including a minimum of five supervised nighttime driving hours of supervised driving before taking you for your PDA. 
If you have used the Learn and Log app to record all supervised driving hours, submit the declaration in the app 24 hours prior to the PDA, and you must produce your learner's permit card or one form of primary and one form of secondary identification prior to undertaking the PDA. Note, ensure your logbook has been completed correctly and signed or you will not be assessed. If you are late for your appointment, your PDA will be canceled and you will have to pay for another assessment. During your PDA, you will be given clear directions and no attempt will be made to confuse or trick you. The roads on which you will travel have been chosen to give a fair evaluation of your driving ability. The driving assessor will be understanding, but will not discuss your driving as this may distract you. Remember, it is not the assessor's job to teach you how to drive. You should expect long periods of silence, but that does not mean the assessor disapproves or is unfriendly. Listen carefully to what the assessor asks you to do and carry out the instructions as well as you can. After the PDA, if there is enough time, the assessor may discuss your driving with you. Assessors are subject to regular auditing and training. The auditor, trainer, or trainee sits in the rear of the vehicle observing and recording the assessor's role in the assessment. Step 6. Provisional License Once you have your provisional license, you can drive without supervision. For the next two years, you will have to display P-plates whenever you drive. A person will be issued with a provisional license if they have not previously held a valid driver's license issued in either WA or another state or country for an aggregate period of two years and or are younger than 19. While a novice driver on P-plates, it is illegal to drive with any alcohol in your blood, i.e. blood alcohol content of 0%. Supervising drivers are subject to blood alcohol content levels and a prohibition on illicit drugs in their system when supervising a learner driver. These are the same requirements that apply to the supervisor if they were driving the vehicle. You will be subject to nighttime driving restrictions for the first six months of your provisional license period. This means you are unable to drive between the hours of midnight, 5 a.m. Nighttime driving restrictions do not apply to people traveling to, from, and in the course of paid or voluntary work or for training or education purposes. If you do, Need to drive between midnight and 5 a.m. for these reasons, we suggest you obtain and carry proof with you, such as a letter from your employer. You will also be subject to demerit point restrictions until you have held a driver's license for two years or periods adding up to two years. During your provisional license period, you must display P-plates in a visible position at the front and back of your vehicle or motorcycle at all times. Further information regarding these restrictions and other laws relating to provisional drivers is available online at www.transportwa.gov.au. If you hold a provisional license, you may be disqualified and your license canceled if you are convicted of any of the offenses listed below. Driving or attempting to drive a motor stealing a motor vehicle, vehicle with a BAC equal to or in. Excess of 0.02%. Failing to stop after a crash. Careless driving, including issue of infringement. Failing to report a crash. Failing to stop when called upon to do. Failing to supply your correct name so by a police officer. And address when required by a police unlawfully interfering with the officer. Mechanism of a vehicle. Driving with a prescribed illicit drugs and using false number plates, or being in oral fluid or blood, possession of false driver or vehicle. Forging or altering any driver license license documents, or document, vehicle license document, causing excessive noise or smoke or number plate from a vehicle's tires. Unlawfully possessing and using false number plates. Getting a motorcycle license. To get a Class RN, Moped, or RE, Motorcycle Restricted, license, you first need to obtain a learner's permit. You can apply for a learner's permit to drive a moped at the age of 15 years and 6 months. Before you get your learner's permit, you will have to answer a series of questions on the road rules and some specific questions relating to riding motorcycles. As with all learner's permits, you are not allowed to ride on the road unless you have an instructor with you. 
This can be a licensed professional driving instructor or someone who currently holds a valid license for the same motorcycle class as your learner's permit. Your instructor must have held a Class C, RE, or R license, or equivalent, for at least two years in the case of instructing a person to ride a moped, and at least four years for all other classes. You must carry your permit and drive within the conditions shown on the permit. Your supervisor can be carried on the pillion seat or in the sidecar, or they may ride another motorcycle. You must display L plates on the front and rear of the motorcycle you are riding. Getting a heavy vehicle license. Before you get a heavy vehicle license class LR, light rigid, MR, medium rigid, HR, heavy rigid, HC, heavy combination, or MC, multi combination, you must meet the experience requirements for that class of license. See Appendix 1. You may need to obtain a learner's permit prior to undertaking lessons to drive a heavy vehicle. Please visit www.transportwa.gov.au slash dvs for further information. Once you have obtained your heavy vehicle learner's permit, you can commence learning to drive the relevant class of heavy vehicle. You cannot learn to drive unless you have an instructor with you. Your instructor can be a licensed professional driving instructor or someone who currently holds a valid license for the same class as stated on your learner's permit, and they must have held that class of license for four years or more. Assessment for heavy vehicles. During your driving assessment, you must demonstrate your skills in a vehicle appropriate to the license class. If the vehicle used for your assessment is fitted with a non synchromesh gearbox, you will have to change gears using the double D clutch method. If you pass your assessment in a vehicle with an automatic or synchromesh gearbox, you will be granted with a license stating such conditions. To obtain an MC class license, you have to meet the class eligibility requirements, see Appendix 1, and successfully complete an industry training course. Please contact your local driver and vehicle services, DVS, center or regional DVS agent for details of assessment arrangements and training course providers. Seniors Assessments Persons aged 85 and over are required to undertake a driving assessment to retain the authority to drive heavy vehicles each year before their license is renewed. Annual medical assessments are required for all license holders aged 80 years and over. Please note, doctors concerned about a person's medical fitness to drive may recommend a person undertake a driving assessment. Bribery it is a serious offense to offer any gift or payment to obtain a license. Any person who makes such an offer will be prosecuted. Organ donation. Organ and tissue donation is an act of giving. When you reach the age of 16, you can register to make an organ or tissue donation if an unexpected event such as a car crash or a medical condition takes your life. Registering as an organ donor means that if you are declared dead, your family will be asked to allow your wishes regarding the donation of organs or tissue to be fulfilled. This is how organs and tissue are obtained for transplantation. The following information can help you make a decision about this very important subject. The importance of organ donation. There are a considerable number of children, teenagers, and adults throughout Australia who are waiting desperately for organ and tissue transplants. Organ and tissue donation can be either a life-saving or a life-enhancing procedure for these people. The organs that can be donated are kidneys, heart, lungs, liver, and pancreas. Tissue donations include corneas, heart valves, and long bones. You can choose all of these or select individual organs or tissue you wish to donate. You may also indicate that you do not wish to be an organ and tissue donor. Circumstances of organ and tissue donation. If you elect to donate your organs, donation will only take place after you have been certified dead and after your family has given its approval. In Australia, death is defined as either irreversible cessation of all functions of the brain or circulation of the blood. Brain death occurs when the brain has lost all function from lack of blood flow and is unable to recover. To determine function, senior doctors who cannot be involved in transplantation carry out a number of tests. The tests are done twice. Tissue donation takes place after clinical death when the heart has stopped and breathing ceased. Tissue donation can take place up to 24 hours after death. 
Organ donation can take place only under certain circumstances where someone is declared brain dead in hospital. This usually occurs in an intensive care unit and the person is always on a ventilator. Tissue donation takes place after death, that is, when breathing and heartbeat have ceased. Medical Procedures in Organ Donation Donated organs are removed in an operating theater by some of Australia's leading surgeons. Organ donation is treated like any other surgical operation. The body is not disfigured and can be viewed by the family after the procedure. Once the organs are removed, the operation is complete. The family of the donor is then able to see their relative again. Funeral and burial arrangements are not affected by organ donation and remain the responsibility of the family. Becoming a Registered Organ Donor To register your wish to become an organ donor, you need to complete an Australian Organ Donor Register, AODR, form. This form is available at Medicare office locations or online at www.donatelife.gov.au. The Australian Organ Donor Register is a national register that has replaced the driver's license system for recording your wish to be an organ donor. Generally, there are no limitations on organ and tissue donation, so both young children and elderly adults can still register on the AODR. You must also talk to your family because they are the people who will be approached should you become a donor. If they are not aware of your wishes, they may not give permission for the donation to take place. This decision is so much harder if your family is unaware of your wishes and they are asked to make a decision on your behalf. Family discussion is very important. To find out more about organ donation, contact one of the following organizations. Donate Life Australian Organ Donor Register www.donatelife.gov.auhtps colon slash slash www.servicesaustralia.gov.au Lion's Eye Bank PH 9381-0770 Australian Organ Donor Register Phone 1-800-777-203 Australian Kidney Foundation, PH 9322-1354. Blood Donation. Every single day someone needs blood or blood products. Precious blood donations help save people with cancer, heart, stomach and bowel diseases, pregnant women and their babies, road trauma victims, and many other serious medical situations. The Importance of Blood Donation. One in three people are likely to need blood at some stage in their life, and yet currently only one in 30 donated. Once you reach your 18th birthday, you can start saving lives by giving blood. Are you eligible? Blood donors need to be between 18 and 76 years old, weigh over 50 kilograms, feel fit and healthy, not had a tattoo or body piercing in the last four months, and not lived in the UK between 1980 and 1996 for six months or more. If you believe you are eligible, you can call 13 14 95 to make an appointment and talk to a medical officer to check your eligibility. Special criteria applies to donating blood to ensure the safest blood supply for the Australian health system. If you would like more information on eligibility criteria, visit www.lifeblood.com AU slash blood. Where to give blood? Call 13 14 95 or go to www.lifeblood.com AU slash blood to make an appointment at the following blood donor centers. Metro Donor Centers, Perth CBD, Fremantle, Cannington, Midland, Edgewater, Morley, and Rockingham. Regional Donor Centers, Albany and Bunbury. It takes someone special to give blood. Part 3. Major Road Rules and Additional Safety Advice All drivers and riders should know the road rules. The following are some of the major ones together with some additional safety advice. Speed Limits You must not exceed the legal speed limit for the road or area in which you are driving. Never drive at an unsafe speed for the conditions that exist at the time. What are the speed limits? There are three major types of speed limits. Speed limits that are shown on signs. 
These can vary from as low as 10 km per hour up to 110 km per hour. Times when the limits apply can be shown on the signs, such as for school zones, or the signs can apply for roads in an area, such as area speed limits. Speed limits that apply when there are no speed limit signs. They are called default speed limits. One is the build-up area limit and one is the maximum state speed limit. In build-up areas, in a build-up area, the default speed limit is 50 km per hour unless a sign shows a different speed. A build-up area is any road on which there is provision for street lighting at intervals of not over 100 meters for a distance of at least 500 meters, or which is built up with structures devoted to business, industry, or dwelling houses at intervals of less than 100 meters for a distance of 500 meters or more. Outside build-up areas. The speed limit that applies in Western Australia outside built up areas and where there are no speed limit signs is currently 110 kilometers per hour. The places where this limit starts may be indicated on signs such as a deer restriction sign or a speed limit sign with the word END on it. Temporary speed limits. Temporary speed limit signs for speeds lower than those that normally apply may be installed along a road for a number of reasons such as poor road conditions or work or events being undertaken. These temporary speed limits are for the safety of drivers as well as for people undertaking work or participating in an event on or near a road. The law in regard to temporary speed limits is the same as applies to normal speed limits, that is, you must not exceed the speed limit shown on the sign. Speeding vehicles are a very real threat to the safety of other drivers and road workers. 40. Some reasons for temporary speed limits reductions include the road condition or layout may have changed and you may not be aware of this. While under construction or repair, the road surface may not be safe to drive on at the normal speed e.g. loose gravel, uneven surface, narrow lanes, alignment changes, etc. Some roadwork activities are mobile, such as line marking, road patching, and mowing. The road worker may be moving through the zone and needs a reduced speed limit for. Safety Reasons Note, road workers may not always be visible when traveling through a temporary speed limit zone. Speed limits that apply for certain vehicles and drivers. There are speed limits placed on certain vehicles and drivers, even though a higher speed limit may be permitted for other vehicles or drivers. It should be remembered that speed limits are the maximum you are allowed to drive at under the best conditions. You must drive slower when the road is wet, narrow, slippery, winding, hilly, has a loose surface, etc., or visibility is poor or traffic conditions require you to drive slower for safety. Provisional drivers can drive up to 110 km per hour, where this is the maximum speed limit, but should remember that they are still gaining experience and need to take extra care. Speed Limit Restrictions Max Limit Learner Driver 100 km per hour Vehicles towing caravans or trailers. 100 kilometers per hour. Buses and coaches over 5 tons gross vehicle mass, GVM. 100 kilometers per hour. Vehicles with a gross combined mass, GCM, over 12 tons. 100 kilometers per hour. Passing incident response vehicles, emergency and breakdown vehicles. It is an offense not to give way to an emergency vehicle. Roadside workers operate in a hazardous environment. Drivers must slow down and, if safe to do so, move over when passing stationary incident response vehicles displaying flashing lights. This is known as slow down, move over, or slow-mo. Incident response vehicles are fitted with flashing warning lights and are authorized to stop at the roadside in order to respond to emergencies and breakdowns. They include the following vehicles. Police vehicles. Ambulances, Fire and Emergency Services Vehicles, Motor Breakdown Service Vehicles, Tow Trucks, and Main Roads Incident Response Service Vehicles. Note, flashing lights do not include indicators or hazard warning lights. If you are not sure whether a vehicle which is stationary at the roadside and displaying flashing lights is an incident response vehicle, treat it as if it is. Two-Way Carriageway 
When approaching an incident response vehicle, which is stationary on your side of the road and displaying flashing warning lights, you must approach at a safe speed and be prepared to stop if necessary, and pass the stationary vehicle at no more than 40 kilometers per hour, leaving as much space as is safe in the circumstances. Multi-lane carriageway. When approaching an incident response vehicle, which is stationary at the roadside and displaying flashing warning lights, you must approach at a safe speed and be prepared to stop if necessary. Pass the stationary vehicle at no more than 40 kilometers per hour, whatever lane you are in, and if the incident response vehicle is ahead of you in the same lane, you must move over to another lane if safe to do so. For the safety of all road users, it is suggested that you move over to maintain a one-lane gap between the stationary incident response vehicle and your vehicle. Roadworks Sites Roadworks improve the roads for everyone, ensuring a safer, more efficient, and more convenient road network. Temporary Traffic Control Temporary traffic control may include portable traffic signals, portable boom barriers slash gates, or traffic controllers with stop slow bats. This may apply for works on or near the road, events, or incidents. When approaching temporary traffic control, you must approach with caution at or below the posted speed limit and be prepared to stop when directed to so. You must stop when directed to buy the traffic controller with a stop slow bat the boom barrier slash gate is down, or the temporary traffic signals change to red. If safe to do so, you may drive on when directed to buy the traffic controller. The boom barrier slash gate is fully up unless a traffic signal remains red or a traffic controller holds up a handheld stop sign. The temporary traffic signal turns to green. There may be temporary hazards at these locations, Always drive through with care and pay attention to people working on or near the road. Following distances. You must keep enough distance behind a vehicle that will enable you to stop the vehicle safely in an emergency and without running into the vehicle in front. Most rear-end collisions are caused by drivers following too closely behind the vehicle in front of them. The space or cushion between you and the vehicle in front of you is called the following distance. To determine how much following distance you should allow, consider the speed of the traffic and the condition of the road. The two-second rule. A way of estimating what is an adequate following distance is to use what is called the two-second rule. While driving along the road, look at an object by the side of the road, such as a tree or pole, that will soon be passed by the vehicle ahead. As soon as that vehicle passes the object, say to yourself, 1001, 1002. You should take the full two seconds it takes to say this to reach the object. If you get there before you have said it, you are too close. Slow down until you are at least two seconds behind the vehicle ahead. Always remember to allow a cushion of space at the front, rear, and on both sides of your vehicle. This is the margin for error you have in an emergency situation. The easiest. Cushion of space to control is the one in front of you. Make sure you always maintain a safe following distance. How long does it take to stop your car? The time it takes to stop a car depends on reaction distance, the distance traveled from the time you realize you need to stop until you apply the brakes. An alert driver takes at least one seconds to react to an emergency. At 60 kilometers per hour, the vehicle will travel 25 meters in this time. If you are not concentrating on the road, your reaction time may be three or four seconds, and in some instances, you may not react at all. Braking distance, the distance traveled from the time you apply the brakes until the vehicle stops. At 60 kilometers per hour, you will cover another 20 meters before this happens. Assuming you are driving on a dry road in a modern car with good tires and brakes. When the road is wet, the braking distance will increase because you are not able to brake as hard as you can on a dry road. Braking hard on a wet road may cause your car to skid. The braking distance will also increase if your tires and or brakes are not in good condition. Stopping distance, the total of reaction distance plus braking distance. It is the distance traveled once you react to an emergency, apply the brakes and come to a stop. 
If you are doing 60 kilometers per hour, add 25 meters, which is the best case reaction distance, to 20 meters, which is the best case braking distance, and you will come up with 45 meters. And road conditions. Drive carefully over road surfaces that are covered with loose material or that are in poor condition. Adverse conditions such as wet weather and poor road surfaces increase stopping distances. Let's assume it is a dry day, your car is new and your tires and brakes are in top condition. You are driving along when a child runs onto the road, 45 meters ahead. The table below shows what happens at different travel speeds. The above information has been provided by the Australian Transport Safety Bureau. Remember, the main factors that can influence stopping distance are your vehicle speed, the condition of your brakes and tires, and the road and weather conditions. How long does it take to stop a heavy vehicle? Heavy vehicles and vehicles carrying heavy loads may require extra stopping distance. Although a truck driver may be keeping a safe distance from the vehicle in front, if you cut in and then brake or stop suddenly, e.g. at traffic control signals, you could cause a crash. This could result in damage to your vehicle and injury to yourself and passengers you may be carrying. Driving in different conditions. Driving at night. The distance that you can see ahead and to the side is severely reduced after dark. This means that it will take you longer to respond to hazards after dark. About one third of serious crashes occur after dark. You must use extra caution to allow for the reduced visibility after dark. Switch on your headlights. Drive with your headlights on between the hours of sunset and sunrise or when conditions require it. Be aware of reduced vision. Drive at a speed that allows you to stop within the area lit by your headlights. Your headlights show you what is straight ahead, but not what is around corners or bends in the road. When entering curves at night, slow down and drive carefully. Use of high beam. Use your high beam for better visibility. As high beam lights may dazzle oncoming drivers, you are legally required to dip your headlights. As soon as an approaching vehicle's lights are dipped. When you are within 200 meters of an approaching vehicle, or when you are driving less than 200 meters behind another vehicle, if a vehicle comes towards you with lights on high beam, slow down, look to the left of the road, keep to the left of the road, and if you cannot see, stop. Tips for driving at night. When driving at night, keep your windscreen and headlights clean. Do not wear tinted glasses, except under the advice of an eye specialist. Turn your headlights on when it begins to get dark so that other road users can see you. Do not use fog lamps except where visibility is very poor, and stop and rest if you feel sleepy. Fatigue is one of the major causes of road crashes. Driving in wet or hazardous weather. It is difficult to see clearly in the rain. To improve safety when driving in wet weather. Be sure that your windscreen wipers are in good condition and your windscreen is clean. Turn your headlights onto low beam. Use your air conditioner to prevent your windscreen from misting up and if you do not have an air conditioner, use the heater demister and if necessary, open the windows. You need to be especially observant while driving in the rain as pedestrians and cyclists can be difficult to see. Keeping your distance, see part 3.2.1. It takes longer to stop when the road is wet, so do not follow another vehicle too closely when it is or has been raining. You should at least double the following distance between yourself and the vehicle in front when the road is wet or visibility is poor. Driving in fog or smoke. It is difficult to see clearly when driving in fog or smoke. Don't put your lights on high beam as this only lights up the fog or smoke and makes the road more difficult to see. In fog or smoke you should. Dip your headlights so you can see more easily. Drive slowly. Not follow closely behind another vehicle. And use your fog lights if you have them. Do not use fog lights incorrectly. It is illegal. If your vehicle is fitted with fog lights, either on the front or rear, you must. Only have them on in fog or other hazardous weather conditions that reduce visibility. And not have front fog lamps and headlights on at the same time. Country driving. When driving in the country, consider other road users and be patient. 
Watch out for wildlife and livestock on roads, particularly at sunrise and after sunset. Watch out for tractors towing farm machinery, especially during seeding and harvest times. Plan your journey to ensure you have enough fuel and water to get you to the next town. Don't stop on or near bridges, floodways, or on narrow sections of roadway. Park at the forward end of roadside parking bays to allow others to enter and leave, and don't pull out onto the roadway when you see another vehicle approaching. Wait until the other vehicle has passed. Keeping to the left. There are two keep left rules that are very important. They are for your safety and that of other road users. One rule relates to when there are no lanes marked on roads and the other is when there are lanes. Roads without marked lanes. The keep left rule on these roads means that you must. Keep as far to the left of the road as practicable, especially when you are turning left or going up a hill. Note that motorcycle riders are exempt from this requirement and may. Ride away from the left side, but left of the center of the road or center line. If you are driving a slow-moving vehicle, pull well over to the left to allow following traffic to overtake. Roads with two or more lanes. If the speed limit that applies to a road is 90 kilometers per hour or higher, or there are keep left unless overtaking signs installed, you are not permitted to drive in the right lane of these roads unless you are turning right or making a U-turn and giving a right turn signal. You are overtaking another vehicle. The adjacent left lane is a special purpose lane, such as a bus lane or bicycle lane. The left lane is a left turning lane and you are traveling straight ahead, or the other lanes are congested with traffic. Railway crossings. Railway crossings can be dangerous, especially when there are no flashing lights or boom gates. Remember that trains cannot stop quickly. Even under emergency brakes, a loaded train can take over 1,000 meters to stop and it cannot swerve to avoid a vehicle on the tracks. When you must stop, you must stop before a rail crossing when. You are directed to do so by a railway employee and you may only proceed when told. To do so, you can see or hear a train coming and there is any possibility of a collision. There is a stop, sign at, or near the crossing. If there is a stop, line marked on the road, you must stop before it. If there is no stop, line, you must stop before the stop, sign. Warning bells or flashing red lights are operating. Boom gates are down, or there is traffic ahead of you that prevents you from completely clearing the yellow, keep clear. At all times, cross hatching, section of crossing safely. Be cautious, always expect a train. If there is no stop, line, or stop, sign to show you where to stop, always stop well clear of the crossing, at least three meters from the nearest rail. Remember the train can be up to one meter wider than the tracks on both sides. You must not stop or park at any rail crossing within 20 meters of the nearest rail, either before or after, unless there are parking control signs that allow you to do so. Stop on the yellow, keep clear at all times, cross hatching, section of the crossing, or drive through, around, or under any gate, boom, or barrier at a rail crossing, either when it is down or being raised or lowered. To reduce the risk of being caught on or near the rail line at some crossings, the yellow, keep clear at all times, cross hatching, extends to the traffic lights. When can you drive on? You can drive on when. The lights and bell have stopped flashing and ringing. You are certain there are no more trains coming. Be aware that other trains may be coming from the opposite direction and during peak periods there may be three or four. Trains before the crossing is cleared. You are sure you can safely clear the crossing, or you are directed to do so by a railway employee. Buses and taxis. You must give way to a bus moving out from a bus stop in a buildup area providing the bus is indicating and has a give way sign displayed on the back. Bus lanes are reserved for use by public buses. In some instances, taxis are also permitted to use a bus lane. You must not drive in a bus lane or a bus slash taxi lane unless you are leaving or entering a road, passing a turning vehicle or passing an obstruction. You must give way to vehicles already in these lanes before you cross or enter them. Crossing water on roadways. Floodways and river crossings are dangerous places. 
Inexperienced drivers should use an alternative route if one is available. However, if there is no alternative route before crossing water on the road, such as floodways, streams, or rivers, always check. The depth of the water by getting out of the vehicle and physically walking the intended crossing if it is safe to do so. If the water is not flowing, the water level should be no higher than the bottom of the vehicle on conventional two-wheel drive vehicles and no higher than the average adult's knee when standing on higher. For wheel drive vehicles, if the water is flowing and deeper than the bottom of the vehicle's chassis, do not cross. Do not cross if the water level is too deep or fast flowing. Traffic signs. Signs are installed along our roads to make them safer for all users. There are a number of categories of road signs, they are. Regulatory signs. The purpose of regulatory signs is to control traffic. You must obey a regulatory sign. Pedestrian crossing. Handheld stop sign. Warning signs. Warning signs alert you of possible dangers ahead. They are generally yellow with black lines, writing or numbers on them. Pedestrian warning signs are usually red, orange in color. When you see a warning sign, slow down. In some cases, advisory speed signs are displayed with warning signs, such as approaching sharp curves or bends. If there is such a sign, you should slow down to at least the speed on the sign. In wet weather, slow down even further. Merging. Traffic. Steep. Descent. Stock. Crossing. Truck. Crossing. Children. Crossing. Crossroads T-junction side road. Junction. Y-junction curve. Roundabout signals ahead reverse turn right. Turn right roads narrows. Hairpin bend right. Winding road reverse curve right. Narrow bridge. Slippery road. Guide signs. Guide signs help you find your way around. They give directions, distances, routes, and information on road user services and points of interest. Signs and devices for road works and special purposes. These signs warn you about temporary hazards. They're used where there are road works in progress. Their purpose is to protect people working on or near the road and those traveling along it, to guard against damage to vehicles and to protect the road. Pay particular attention to the signs, including any speed limits that are displayed. Left lane closed. Roadwork signs. These signs are provided to ensure everyone's safety and are enforceable and regulated by law. Disobeying roadwork signs means you are committing an offense, which may lead to fines and demerit points. You may be liable for damage caused to personnel, roadwork equipment, and materials. Vehicles may be damaged by loose stones and gravel. Additional examples. Road markings. Different road markings have different meanings. Markings that are used to mark lanes, lane lines, or separate traffic traveling in opposite directions, dividing lines, are particularly important. Single continuous, unbroken, white lines. Single unbroken lines are used either to mark edge lines, lane lines, or dividing lines, center lines on roads. Where there is a single continuous lines, dividing line, center line, you must not cross that line except to leave or enter the road or turn at an intersection or you turn. You must not cross a continuous dividing line to overtake or a continuous lane line to change lanes. Where the line is between lanes traveling in the same direction, lane lines, you must not cross the line to change lanes. Where the line is an edge line, you may cross the edge line to stop, enter or leave a road, or pass on the left side of a vehicle turning right. Traffic control signals. Traffic control signals are a safe way of deciding who goes and who stops at an intersection. They are there to protect you and to regulate traffic. Always obey the signals facing you. It is an offense not to obey them. When nearing a set of traffic control signals, be prepared to stop if necessary. You cannot do a U-turn at an intersection with traffic control signals unless there is a U-turn permitted sign. Intersection traffic control signals. 
Traffic control signals always have the colored lights in the same order. Red means stop. When the light is red, you must wait behind the stop line marked on the road near the signal. If there is a traffic sign facing you with the words left turn on red permitted after stopping, you may turn left if you can do so safely. Watch out for and give way to pedestrians and other traffic. Remember, you must always stop at the red light first. A yellow light warns you that the signal is about to change to red. If the light is yellow as you approach it, you are required to stop if you can do so safely. When the light is green, you may proceed through the intersection provided it is safe to do so. Watch out for vehicles disobeying the traffic control signals because many serious crashes are caused by vehicles driving through intersections against a red light. Watch out for pedestrians who may still be crossing the road. The flashing yellow light at intersections with traffic control signals indicates that the signals are not working properly. Do not confuse these with Pelican lights, see Part 3.10.3, which provides safe crossing for pedestrians. If there is a flashing yellow light at an intersection, you should treat the intersection as if you have a give way sign facing you, see Part 3.13. Remember to look out for pedestrians. If the traffic control signals are not working at all, no light is displayed, always slow your vehicle and be prepared to stop. Treat the intersection as if you are facing a give way sign. Intersection traffic control arrows. Some traffic control signals have arrows in addition to circular lights. These are used to control the movement of traffic intending to turn at the intersection. If you are going straight ahead, obey the main circular lights. If you are turning, obey the arrow signal that is pointed in the direction that you plan to turn. Red light with green arrow. This means you may not go straight ahead, but you may turn in the direction of the arrow if it is safe to do so. Remember, you must give way to all pedestrians crossing at the intersection. Green light with green arrow. This means you may either go straight ahead or turn in the direction of the arrow if it is safe to do so. If the green arrow disappears and no red light or arrow appears, you may start to proceed, but only if it is safe to do so. Green light with red arrow. This means that you may go straight ahead if it is safe to do so. However, you may not turn in the direction of the arrow. Pelican signals. A pelican crossing works like normal traffic control signals, except that it has an extra phase, a flashing yellow light. Do not confuse pelican signals with flashing yellow lights at intersections, see part 3.10.1, which indicate that the lights are not working. The flashing yellow light at a pelican crossing means proceed with caution. It tells you that you may go ahead unless there are pedestrians crossing. If there are, you must give way to them. Officer directing traffic. When there are unusual traffic flows or if the power is cut, a police officer or other authorized person may be on duty to ease the traffic flow. You should get into the correct lane and indicate clearly where you want to go. You must comply with the direction of a police officer or other authorized person. Their directions overrule. Traffic control signals. Stop and give way signs. The give way to the right rule and arrows or other markings on the road surface. Indicators and hand signals. Indicators and hand signals are an effective way to communicate with other road users. You may be planning to stop, change lanes or turn, but unless you let other drivers know, you can cause problems to other traffic. Be consistent and considerate about using indicators slash signals at the appropriate times. When must you indicate slash signal? You must indicate slash signal your intention before. Turning left or right. Changing lanes. Pulling out from a curb or stationary position. Moving to the left or right making a U-turn, pulling out to overtake, moving back after you have overtaken a vehicle, or slowing down or stopping. Types of indicators slash signals. There are three types of indicators slash signals. Brake lights. You must give a signal of your intention to stop. Brake lights warn other road users that you are slowing down or stopping. Your brake lights must be clearly visible at all times, including in sunlight and at distances of up to 60 meters. Flashing indicators. 
You must give sufficient warning to other drivers and pedestrians of your intention to turn or diverge right or left, change lanes, or overtake another vehicle. What is sufficient warning depends on the circumstance. It is about providing warning of your intentions so that other road users can take the appropriate safety precautions. On high-speed roads, indicating may be necessary for several hundred meters, while on low-speed roads, much lesser distances may be sufficient. If you are starting from a stationary position at the side of a road, you must indicate for at least five seconds prior to driving on. You must also give way to following or overtaking traffic. Do not drive on until it is safe to do so. Remember to turn the indicator off after the turn slash movement has been completed. And indicators slash signals at roundabouts. Roundabouts have several exit points. Enter a roundabout only when there is a safe gap in the traffic and no risk of a crash. Indicate slash signal left if practicable as you are passing the exit before the one you wish to use. Exit in the same lane in which you entered, that is, exit in the left lane if you entered in the left lane or the right lane if you entered the roundabout in the right lane. Generally, take care when you drive in a roundabout, especially when you are changing lanes and leaving it. Watch out for vehicles that are leaving the roundabout, vehicles that are making a full turn, and bicycles, long vehicles, and motorcycles. Freeway driving. There are a number of special road rules and conditions that apply to freeways. Basic freeway rules. Before you drive on a freeway, make sure you are confident in your ability to drive at freeway speeds. As freeway speeds are higher than those normally permitted on roads in build-up areas, see Part 3.1.1, it is even more important to be aware of what is happening around your vehicle. The following may help you. Check your rear vision mirrors frequently and check your blind spots before changing lanes. Indicate slash signal well in advance before you change lanes, enter, or leave the freeway. You must give way to traffic in the lane you are moving into and only move when. It is safe to do so. Move gradually but positively to your selected position on the freeway. Be smooth and courteous when merging with other traffic. During merging, you must give way to another vehicle if any part of the other vehicle is ahead of your vehicle. Keep a safe distance between yourself and the vehicle in front. Keep a lookout for directional signs. The sooner you spot them, the better prepared you will be to get into the correct lane. Move into the lane you want as soon as. Practicable, but remember, where the freeway speed limit is 90 kilometers per hour or higher, do not use the right lane unless you are overtaking or when other lanes are congested. In conditions of reduced visibility, such as rain, fog, or smoke, reduce your speed and increase your following distance. Turn your headlights onto low beam so that other drivers can see you and if your vehicle breaks down on a freeway, pull into the emergency stopping lane or onto the nature strip. Switch on your hazard lights. Stay well away from traffic lanes. Be very careful when you re-enter the traffic flow. Remember to give way to all traffic and indicate for at least five seconds before moving out onto the road. Entering a freeway. Before getting on the freeway, be sure that your vehicle is roadworthy, has more than enough fuel for the journey, and that any load is secure. Plan your journey in advance. Know your entry and exit points before getting on the freeway. Adjust your speed as you drive along the entry ramp. Make sure you are not entering the freeway at a sharp angle. Drive your vehicle so that you merge smoothly with other traffic and be sure to clearly signal your intentions. You need to indicate right before and while you are merging to the right or indicate left before and while merging to the left. Remember to turn off your indicator when the merge is complete. Appropriate speeds for freeway driving. Freeways are designed for higher speed traffic flow than that allowed on standard roads. You must not exceed the speed limit indicated on signs. Driving too slowly can cause dangerous situations on a freeway, so you're required to travel at a speed that is no more than 20 kilometers per hour below the posted speed limit, unless traffic, weather, or visibility conditions prevent you from doing so. That is, if the speed limit is 100 kilometers per hour, you are not allowed to travel slower than 80 kilometers per hour unless the road, weather, 
visibility, traffic, and other conditions require you to travel slower. Leaving the freeway. Select the correct lane for your destination well in advance of the exit and also indicate your intention to leave the freeway well in advance. When safe to do so, move gradually but positively into the exit lane. Slow down as you are entering the exit ramp and adjust your speed so that you are prepared for driving in suburban or city conditions beyond the end of freeway sign. What you must not do on a freeway. When driving on a freeway, you must not. Enter the bus or bus slash taxi lane unless you are authorized to do so. Stop unnecessarily. Reverse your vehicle or make a U-turn. Stop on the median strip, nature strip, or emergency stopping lane, except in an emergency or to help another disabled vehicle. Ride a moped, bicycle, or animal. Drive a tractor other than a prime mover or carry an oversized load. Pedestrians and cyclists are not allowed on freeways except on paths. Intersections Intersections can be very dangerous places, so be careful. There are different types of intersections, and for each type there are rules which help to reduce the danger. Know the rules, stay alert, and drive at a safe speed. Controlled intersections A controlled intersection is an intersection that has traffic control signals, a stop, or give way sign, a roundabout, or a police officer or other authorized person directing traffic. At an intersection controlled by traffic control signals, be prepared to stop if the light changes to yellow or red. At an intersection controlled by a give way sign, give way to all traffic traveling along or turning from the intersecting road. At an intersection controlled by a stop sign, you must stop your vehicle and give way to all traffic traveling along or turning from the intersecting road. You will notice a line marked across the road before the intersection where there are stop signs. You must stop at the line. If for some reason you have to stop back from the stop line, you must stop again as close as you can before the line when you move forward. If there is no line, stop as close to the intersection as practicable but before entering it. Give way to all traffic coming from the left or right, including turning vehicles. You must give way to car A and car C. Car B must give way to you. Car A and car C. When a police officer or an authorized person is directing traffic, take your directions from that person. Their directions overrule traffic control signals and signs. If their back is towards you, you must stop your vehicle and wait for instructions before driving on. Uncontrolled intersections. Uncontrolled intersections are those without traffic control signals, a give way or stop sign or roundabout, or a police officer or authorized person directing traffic. The rules for uncontrolled intersections that help to make them safer are if you are turning right at any uncontrolled intersection, you must also give way to oncoming traffic traveling towards you or turning left. Roundabouts. Keep intersections clear. Turning. Turning in front of oncoming traffic is dangerous. Always ensure that the turn can be made safely without interfering with the progress of oncoming vehicles. While waiting to turn across traffic, keep your wheels in the straight ahead position. This is because if you happen to be struck from behind, you will not be pushed across into the path of oncoming traffic. When to indicate slash signal your intention to turn. Indicate slash signal for a sufficient distance prior to turning or diverging left or right to warn other drivers and pedestrians of your intentions. Make sure you give as much warning as possible. What is a sufficient distance depends on the circumstances. If you are traveling at high speed, a sufficient distance may be several hundred meters. Turning. The rules when making a turn are as follows. Turning vehicles must give way to pedestrians. U-turns. You must not make a U-turn. Unless the turn can be made safely and without interfering with the movement of other traffic. If there is a NOU turn sign. At traffic control signals, unless there is a U-turn permitted sign, or on a freeway, control arrows. Remember, when making a U-turn, the correct procedure is to look in your rear view mirror. Indicate slash signal your intentions. 
Check for following traffic by glancing over your shoulder and turn only if it is safe to do so. Turning at a multi-lane intersection. When turning at a multi-lane intersection, move into the correct lane early. Do not change lanes at the last moment. Do not cross unbroken lane lines unless you are driving a vehicle 7.5 meters long or longer and you cannot turn from within a single lane. Be in the correct position on the roadway before the intersection and if you are in a lane marked with an arrow, you must go in the direction of the arrow. Remember, turn only when you can see clearly. Large vehicles such as buses, trucks, and vans may block your view of approaching traffic. Changing lanes. A high percentage of crashes occur when vehicles change lanes. This is because drivers changing lanes are often not aware that another vehicle is already in the lane into which they wish to move. To change lanes safely, you should check your internal and external mirrors. Indicate slash signal to change lanes for a sufficient distance to warn other drivers of your intentions before beginning your maneuver. The higher the speed, the greater. The indicator slash signaling distance you must give. Glance over your left or right shoulder to make sure there is not another vehicle in your blind spot. Check for other drivers who may also be moving into the lane. Give way to vehicles already in the lane you are entering. Never change lanes while going through or approaching an intersection and never change lanes where the line between lanes is a continuous line. If someone ahead of you indicates slash signals that they wish to change into your lane, be courteous and let them in. Overtaking control arrows. Overtaking other vehicles is one of the most dangerous driving maneuvers. Only overtake when it is safe to do so. If you are not sure, wait. You must not exceed the speed limit to overtake. You must not cross continuous lines to overtake, where the line is a single continuous line, continuous line on the left of a broken line, or double continuous lines. When can you overtake? You can overtake a vehicle on the left only when. You are directed to do so by a police officer or other authorized person. You are on a multi-lane road, and it is safe to do so, and... A vehicle is indicating slash signaling that it is turning right. You can also overtake any vehicles that are stationary behind it. You can overtake a vehicle on the right when you are both traveling in the same direction and it is safe and legal to do so. When you must not overtake. You must not overtake another vehicle. It has slowed down or stopped at a railway, pedestrian, or children's. Crossing. It has stopped at an intersection, unless the driver signals that they are turning left or right, and it is safe to do so. There is a NO overtaking sign, and you are nearing a blind bend or the crest of a hill, or you do not have a good view of the road ahead. You must not cross single continuous dividing lines or continuous dividing lines on your side of broken lines or double continuous dividing lines to overtake a moving vehicle. How to overtake. To overtake safely, you must get a good view of the road ahead. Make sure you have plenty of time and space to return safely to the correct side of the road after overtaking. Look behind and to the side of you. Before overtaking, check your mirrors and glance over your shoulder to check your blind spots. Another vehicle may be overtaking you. Indicate slash signal for a sufficient distance before you pull out to overtake. Keep to the speed limit. You must not exceed the speed limit when overtaking another vehicle and move back into line. You must ensure you are safely clear of the vehicles you have overtaken and signal your intention to return to the correct side of the road. Before you do so, what to do when you are being overtaken? You should move to the left to allow plenty of clearance for the overtaking vehicle. Remember, you must not. Increase your speed until the overtaking vehicle has completely passed you or drive in a way that prevents a vehicle from overtaking or passing you. Large and oversized vehicles. Vehicles 7.5 meters long and longer need to make wide turns, so be careful when you are traveling near a large vehicle that is turning or negotiating a roundabout. Do not overtake once the driver has signaled an intention to turn. They may cut the corner when they are turning at an intersection and before they turn, they are also legally allowed to cross over a continuous lane line leading up to the intersection. 
Here are a few other tips for when you encounter a large vehicle or one carrying an oversized load on the road. Generally, they need more space than a car when stopping, so be courteous and avoid overtaking and then cutting in at traffic signals, roundabouts, and other. Locations where traffic cues occur. They accelerate slowly, so be patient, as the driver has to move through many gears to get going. And when a large vehicle is turning onto the road you are on, keep back from the intersection as it will require more road space to make the turn. Truck drivers and drivers of other large vehicles have a difficult task when reversing, so give them plenty of room to move. Remember, if you can't see the driver's side mirrors, the driver can't see you. A guide to overtaking large vehicles. Be patient. Take your time and stay back several car lengths without crossing the center of the road. When you see that it is safe to pass, indicate slash signal, move out, accelerate, and overtake quickly and positively, keeping in mind the road, visibility, weather. Conditions and speed limit. Use your left indicator when you are about to return to the left side of the road. After overtaking, maintain your speed. Do not overtake and then cut in and slow down. This forces the other driver to brake and lose momentum. Allow for oncoming vehicles. They may be traveling faster than you think. Only overtake when the road ahead is clear. Waiting a few seconds could save your life. Never attempt to overtake a truck or other large vehicle on a curve or hill where visibility is limited, even when the vehicle is moving slowly. Make good use of overtaking lanes to overtake trucks and other large vehicles. Be ready for the wind buffeting you as you pass, and be extra careful after dark. Passing an oversized vehicle accompanied by a pilot vehicle coming from the opposite direction. Many oversized vehicles are accompanied by a pilot vehicle. The pilot vehicle has two rotating yellow lights and warning signs on its roof. Pilot vehicles usually travel at a distance in front of the oversized vehicle to warn approaching drivers. Slow down and remain at a slow speed until the oversize. Vehicle passes or stop if directed to do so by the driver of the pilot vehicle. Cooperate with the driver of the pilot vehicle when he or she signals you to move over. The oversized vehicle may need to be in the center of the road. And... If you move off the bitumen, reduce speed and watch for guideposts that may indicate a deep culvert. Be especially careful if the edge of the road is wet. Passing an oversized vehicle from behind. Passing an oversized vehicle is potentially dangerous. If there is only one pilot vehicle, it will be in front of the oversized vehicle and the driver will not be able to. See you at the rear. Be patient and wait for a safe opportunity to pass. Usually, the oversized vehicle will periodically pull over and stop to allow traffic to pass. If there is also a rear escort vehicle, you should take directions from the person driving that vehicle. Drivers of pilot vehicles are authorized traffic wardens. You must obey their lawful directions. And if you have a CB radio in your vehicle, it can be helpful to talk to the pilot or escort vehicle driver to find out if it is safe to pass. Use UHF Channel 40. The above information has been provided by Main Roads WA. Stopping. There are places where stopping a vehicle in a number of places can be dangerous to the driver and passengers of the vehicle, to other vehicles, or to pedestrians. You must not stop in a number of places such as in intersections or within 10 meters of an intersection, unless signs allow you to stop. Within 20 meters of the approach side and 10 meters of the leaving side of a pedestrian or children's crossing. Between another stopped or parked vehicle and the center of a road. In bus lanes, bus slash taxi lanes or bicycle lanes. Within one meter of a fire hydrant or fire plug. Within 20 meters of the approach side and 10 meters of the leaving side of a bus stop. Within 20 meters of a railway crossing on a bridge or in a tunnel, within three meters of a letterbox, on a median strip or path, in clearways during the times shown on the signs, on freeways, except in an emergency or you have broken down or helping someone who has broken down, in which case you must stop in the emergency stopping lane or on the nature strip, where there are eno stopping or eno standing signs or a single yellow line along the edge of the road. No standing. 
is the same as NO stopping or on the road on crests or curves where the vehicle is not visible to an overtaking driver for at least 50 meters in a build-up area or 150 meters outside a build-up area. Parking to park means to permit the vehicle to remain stationary whether the vehicle is attended or not, except for the purpose of avoiding conflict with other traffic, complying with another law, or picking up or setting down passengers or goods for a maximum of two minutes. Before you park your vehicle, ask yourself, is it safe to park here? Is it legal? And will it cause trouble to other road users? Where you must not park, you must not park your vehicle or any part of your vehicle anywhere stopping is not permitted as indicated in part 3.17 or in the following places. In front of a right-of-way, passage, or private driveway. In a NO parking area, except for up to two minutes to pick up or put down goods or passengers, or in parking bays for people with disabilities. Bays marked with the international symbol. Shown in the diagram are reserved for holders of a current ACROD parking permit. Misuse of these bays can result in a fine. How to park. Before you move into a parking place, check for traffic behind you. Slow down and give correct signals. Always apply the park brake, remove the ignition key, and lock the doors when you leave your vehicle. When parking in a two-way street, you must park close to and parallel with the left boundary of the street. Unless signs indicate otherwise, you may park on either side in a one-way street. When parking in a confined space, pull alongside and parallel to the car you wish to park behind. Reverse very slowly. Steer sharply to the left until your car is nearly on a 45-degree angle to the curb. Your left front door should now be opposite the rear bumper of the car in front. When your front bumper is clear of the rear bumper of the car ahead, turn your steering wheel fully to the right and continue reversing, and straighten your wheels and move forward to the correct position before reversing. Use caution and reverse no further than necessary. Remember, it is an offense to reverse when it is unsafe or for a greater distance than is reasonable, and make sure that all is clear behind you. When parking on a hill, apply the park brake. If you are driving a vehicle with automatic transmission, select Park P or if you are driving a vehicle with manual transmission, select the gear which is opposite to the slope of the hill. That is, if you are facing uphill, select first gear. If you are facing downhill, select reverse gear. When parking up or downhill, you should turn your tires towards the curb so your vehicle rolls into the curb instead of rolling forward, backwards, or into the road. After you park, you should look out for traffic, especially cyclists, and wait until it is safe before you open the door. Before pulling out from a parking spot, make sure you are in the correct gear. Do not allow the vehicle to roll back and check for other traffic, indicate slash signal for at least five seconds, and then drive off smoothly into a safe gap in traffic. Clearways. Clearways are sections of roads where you cannot stop vehicles during certain times of the day or night. Clearways allow the traffic to flow more easily during peak traffic periods. How do you know which roads are clearways? Clearways are marked by a special sign, a large white C on a red shield or on a parking meter. When can you park? The times stated on signs tell you when you cannot park. This is usually during the morning and or evening peak traffic periods. What happens if you park when you are not supposed to? Parking your vehicle in a clearway will slow down the traffic flow. The penalties for doing so are high and can include heavy fines or your vehicle being towed away. 79. Part 4. Emergencies and Incidents. Motor Injury Insurance. The Insurance Commission of Western Australia, Insurance Commission, runs the Motor Injury Insurance Scheme in Western Australia and has since 1943. Over that time, the Insurance Commission has assisted 100,000 injured motorists, passengers, pedestrians, and cyclists paying over $7 billion. 
Motor injury insurance is compulsory, so people injured in motor vehicle crashes are able to claim compensation if the crash was caused by the actions of another party. Motor injury insurance applies to all vehicles upon licensing, making it convenient and effective for you to insure your vehicle and yourself against liability for personal injury caused to third parties. What does your motor injury insurance cover? The cost of personal injury and death caused to others in Australia by any driver of the licensed vehicle, which includes compensation for pain and suffering, past and future economic loss, claims management expenses, and care and support, including medical treatment and rehabilitation. The cost of necessary and reasonable care and support, including medical treatment and rehabilitation, for catastrophic injuries incurred by yourself, if no other driver in the crash is negligent, and others, if no driver in the crash is negligent, resulting from a motor vehicle crash in Western Australia involving the licensed vehicle after the introduction of the expanded motor injury insurance cover. What is not covered by your motor injury insurance? The cost of damage caused to vehicles or other property from a motor vehicle crash. The cost of non-catastrophic injuries where no other driver is negligent in the crash. The above cover is subject to the provisions of the relevant legislation. Full details of the insurance policy and conditions are available at icwa.wa.gov.au. Your obligations. You must report all motor vehicle crashes causing injury or death to the Insurance Commission and Western Australia Police via the online crash reporting facility, available at crashreport.com.au. You or any driver of the licensed vehicle must not use the vehicle for any other purpose not stated in your vehicle license application. Drive the vehicle in an unsafe or damaged condition. Drive the vehicle if under the influence of intoxicating liquor or illegal drugs, and drive the vehicle without the appropriate driver's license. If you breach these obligations, the Insurance Commission may pursue you for repayment of the total compensation costs paid to an injured third party as a result of your negligence. Cost of Cover Motor injury insurance premiums are set based on the vehicle class of the motor vehicle and the claims experience for that class. When licensing your vehicle, you will be asked to identify the class based on the type of motor vehicle you drive and the primary purpose for which it will be used. The premium schedule on the website of the Insurance Commission details the cost of motor injury insurance for each of the 20 registered vehicle classes in Western Australia. The Insurance Commission reviews insurance premiums each year based on independent actuarial advice, actual and estimated claims experience, and a fully funded insurance model. Western Australia has one of the most cost-effective motor vehicle personal injury insurance schemes in Australia. Please refer to the website of the Insurance Commission for further information on motor injury insurance, www.icwa.wa.gov.au. The previous chapters have provided advice that can help avoid emergencies. It is vital that you study and learn that information and apply it whenever you are driving or riding a motor vehicle. This part is a guide to what you should do if you are involved in a crash or other emergency situation. How to handle emergencies. You must not use the horn or any other warning instrument on your vehicle, except in an emergency or to prevent injury to a person or property. Breakdown on the road. Approach a broken down vehicle or crash scene with caution, but do not allow yourself to be distracted from the road. Look out for pedestrians at the scene. If your vehicle develops engine trouble and begins to slow, move to the left as far as possible from traffic. If your vehicle breaks down on the road in an exposed position, activate the hazard warning lights immediately. Have passengers leave the vehicle when it is safe to do so and keep them well clear of traffic. If possible, avoid working on the traffic side of your vehicle. You may place a hazard warning triangle to the side of the road or a traffic lane. Within a built-up area, place the triangle up to 50 meters away. Outside build-up. Areas or on high-speed roads, place it up to 200 meters away. When walking to place the triangle, hold it in front of you to alert drivers to the hazard. Hold it behind you when you collect it and return to your vehicle. 
If you have a bright, reflective safety vest, wear it and... During an on-road emergency, use a CB radio road channel to alert approaching traffic, particularly heavy vehicles. Emergency assistance may sometimes be reached via the government-allocated CB radio, Emergency Channel 9, on HF or 5 on UHF. Try both simplex and duplex. If you find yourself obstructing traffic on a freeway or major metropolitan road, main roads may help relocate you to a safer location at no cost. From there, you can arrange further towing services to take your vehicle to your preferred location. Call main roads on 138-138. Tire blowout, rapid puncture. A front wheel puncture will pull your vehicle in the direction of the puncture. For example, if the puncture is in the right front tire, the vehicle will be pulled to the right. A rear wheel puncture will tend to cause your vehicle to swerve from side to side. If a puncture occurs, Keep a firm grip on the steering wheel. Do not oversteer to correct any swerve or pull. Take your foot off the accelerator. Once you have gained better control of the car, gently apply the brakes. Slow down, pull over to the side of the road, and stop in a safe spot, and... If your car is fitted with hazard lights, switch them on. A stuck accelerator. If you release the accelerator pedal to reduce speed and the car continues at the same speed or accelerates, your accelerator is stuck. If this happens, depress the clutch or in an automatic vehicle, select neutral N. Apply firm pressure on the brakes without locking the wheels. Find a safe place to pull off the road and stop. Stop and then turn off the ignition and... If your car is fitted with hazard lights, switch them on. Brake failure. If you push the brake pedal down and the car does not slow down or stop, you're experiencing brake failure. If this happens, it may help to pump the brake pedal hard and fast. Move to a lower gear whether you are driving a manual or an automatic vehicle. Gently apply the park brake. If necessary, use your horn and or flash your headlights to warn other drivers. Move to the side of the road. Carefully stop the vehicle using the park brake and if your car is fitted with hazard lights, switch them on. Possible head-on collision. Another vehicle is speeding towards you and a head-on collision seems likely. If this happens, brake firmly without skidding while flashing your lights and sounding your horn. Give the oncoming vehicle all the room you can. Look for an avenue of escape and prepare for further evasive action, including pulling off the road if necessary. Forced onto the gravel. If you have been forced onto the gravel edge of a road, don't rush to get back onto the road. Instead, keep a firm grip on the steering wheel and drive in a straight line and slow down and check traffic before you enter the road again. Stalled on a railway crossing. If you hear or see a train coming, leave the car immediately. Do not risk your life or those of your passengers trying to save your car. If no trains are coming, make one or two attempts to restart the engine, but be careful not to flatten the battery. If you are unable to restart the engine, get out of the car and seek help to push your vehicle off the track. If your car has an automatic transmission, select neutral, N, and try to push it off the track, and if your car has a manual transmission, you may be able to move it off the track by trying this procedure. Put the car in first or reverse gear. Release the clutch and take your feet off all the pedals and turn the key to and hold it in the start position. The car should move enough to get you off the track. Bonnet flies up. If your bonnet flies up while you are driving, slow down. Look through the gap under the hinge of the bonnet or use side windows to retain a view of the road and brake smoothly to a stop, pulling off the road as soon as possible. Shattered windscreen. If your windscreen shatters while you are driving, slow down and pull over to the side of the road as soon as possible. Car fire. Most vehicle fires are caused by a short circuit in the electrical system. If this happens, Slow down and stop and turn off the ignition.
get any passengers out of the car and away from the fire. If the fire is beyond control, move away. Petrol may cause an explosion. If you have an appropriate extinguisher, use it to put out the fire. If you do not have an extinguisher, try to extinguish the flames with a thick cloth or garment, sand or dirt. Try to isolate and remove the cause. Disconnect the battery quickly if possible. If this is not practicable, rip loose any burning wires with a handy instrument. Never touch burning wires or insulation with your bare hands and call for help. Skids. A skid occurs when your car's wheels lock and the car is being dragged along by its own momentum. When this happens, you lose steering control. The only way to regain control of the car is to stop the skid. What causes skids? A skid does not just happen. It is almost always the result of a driver's actions, such as sudden or excessive braking, harsh acceleration, coarse or uncontrolled steering, or excessive speed. Skids are dangerous at all times, but certain conditions can make them even worse. For example, while you are driving, poor car maintenance, such as bald tires and low tire pressure, and Road conditions, water, oil, or sand on the road can make it slippery. The ABC of avoiding skids. You are unlikely to have much time or space to correct a skid. A clear understanding of the causes of skidding will help you to avoid them. Adjust your speed to suit driving conditions and always remember the ABC of skid prevention. Accelerate gently, brake gently, and corner gently. Post-crash management. A crash is something you will try to avoid. However, should you be involved in one, you must know what to do. If you're involved in a crash, stop immediately. Help anyone who has been injured, but before doing so, check that your actions do not put yourself or others in danger. Send someone for help if required. Give your name, address, and number plate to the owner or driver of the other vehicle. If property has been damaged, give the owner of the property your particulars as well. If someone has been injured, report the crash online at www.crashreport.com.au. Provide the name and address of all drivers, number plates of all vehicles, time, date, and location of the crash, and if any injury has occurred or if there is more than $3,000 damage done to vehicles and or property in total, or if the owner of the damaged property is not present. You must report the crash to the police. If you are involved in a crash where someone has been injured, you must stop immediately and help. If you do not stop, the penalties are very severe. You could be imprisoned, lose your license, be fined, or accrue demerit points. If you are removing a wrecked or damaged vehicle from a road, you must also remove any glass or other destructive, injurious, or dangerous substance or item that has fallen on the road from that vehicle. If the driver of the vehicle is injured, the person who removes the vehicle from the road is responsible for removing any dangerous or loose material. What to do if you need a tow after an accident? It is an offense for a tow truck operator to force, trick, threaten, or pester a person to sign up for a tow. Phone your insurance company telling them the car needs towing. Ask for the name of the tow company and driver the insurer is sending. Don't be fooled by tow truck operators who say they can tow for anybody. They can legally, but they may not be the preferred operator and you could be leaving. Yourself open to outrageous fees. If a tow truck driver is a nuisance, ask police to intervene. Not insured? Make sure the tow truck driver gives you a cost and writes you an invoice before signing. The cost of the tow is just the start of charges. There are additional fees like storage fees and excess kilometers. Police can also decide if a driver involved in an accident is too injured or traumatized to authorize towing, in which case police can assign the job. First aid. When someone is injured, the first few minutes after a crash are vital. Until trained help arrives, your knowledge of first aid may save a life. An injured person may have life, threatening injuries, such as a blocked airway or severe bleeding. Consider undertaking a first aid course so you are prepared to help at the scene of a crash. Danger. 
Check whether there is any danger to yourself first, then bystanders, and then the injured person. If possible, position your car to protect the crash scene. Switch on hazard warning lights or indicators. Send someone to warn approaching traffic. Secure the damaged vehicle by turning off the ignition and putting on the park brake. Prevent others from smoking near the crash site and stay away from fallen power lines, especially if close to or touching the damaged vehicle. Do not move injured people unless they are in danger. Response. Check whether the injured person is conscious or unconscious. If conscious, talk to them and reassure them. Check for injuries and treat. And if there is no response, send for help and then check their airway. Send for help. Call triple zero 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 for an ambulance or if there is a bystander present, ask this person to make the call. Airway. Airway management has the highest priority. It is essential to ensure that the airway is open and clear so that breathing is possible. Open the airway by lifting the chin and tilting the head back. Open mouth to look inside for foreign material e.g. vomit, fluid, broken teeth, and if foreign material is found, clear the airway using your fingers remove any vomit, fluid, or broken teeth. Breathing. Check for normal breathing for up to 10 seconds by looking for chest movement, listening for breathing, and feeling for breaths. Gasping for breath is not normal breathing. If the person is breathing normally, monitor their breathing, manage injuries, and treat for shock. If the injured person is not breathing normally, start CPR. If the injured person is unconscious and trapped in the car, you can still perform CPR by tilting the seat back as far as possible to allow for better access and positioning yourself to give CPR. CPR equals cardiopulmonary resuscitation. CPR is the process of giving 30 chest compressions followed by two breaths. You would expect to achieve five sets of 30 chest compressions and two breaths in about two minutes. Signs of life equals breathing normally, responsive, and moving. If the person is not breathing normally, a gasp is not normal breathing, responding, or moving, begins CPR, cardiopulmonary resuscitation. Giving chest compressions. With the injured person on their back, Give 30 chest compressions. Locate the lower half of the injured person's breastbone and place the heel of one hand, the other on top, to push the breastbone down one-third in depth. Repeat for 30 chest compressions. Giving breaths. Give two breaths by tilting the head with a chin lift. Pinch the nose. Cover the injured person's mouth with your own and breathe. Only stop CPR if the injured person begins to breathe normally and is responsive more. Qualified help arrives, or you are physically unable to continue. If you are unwilling or unable to perform breaths, compression-only CPR will be better than not doing CPR at all. Defibrillation. A defibrillator is used to treat sudden cardiac arrest. If a defibrillator is available, apply the defibrillator and follow the voice prompts. Recommend CPR when instructed by the voice prompt. Continue CPR until more qualified help arrives. If the person starts breathing normally, place them in the recovery position. Do not remove the pads. Do not turn the defibrillator off. Continue to check the person's breathing and be prepared to begin CPR again. Moving an injured person. Unless absolutely necessary, do not move an injured person until medical aid arrives. Moving an injured person unnecessarily may lead to further injury. If the injured person's life is endangered, e.g. risk of an explosion, fire, gas, electrical, remove the person from the scene by the quickest and safest means available, regardless of injuries or the manner in which removal must be made. If head, neck, or spinal injuries are suspected, support the head and neck in a neutral position before carefully moving. Remember, airway and breathing always take precedence. Stay with the patient. If it is safe to do so, stay with the injured person and do not leave them alone. This is particularly important if the person is in shock. If you are the only person on the scene and need to seek help, place a breathing unconscious person in the recovery position, if possible. This assists their breathing. Always continue to monitor their airway and breathing. 
when the injured person is bleeding. To stop external bleeding, any visible bleeding from a wound. Apply direct pressure to the wound. Use whatever is available, for example, your hands, or an item of clothing. If you have a cloth, use it to make a pad and cover the wound, then bandage it. Never remove the original dressing. This will only disturb the clot that is forming. If bleeding continues, put more pads over it, and if pieces of metal, glass, or what are found in the wound apply pressure to the surrounding areas, but do not remove object. If a broken bone is protruding, apply pressure to the wound edges only. If the person is bleeding from the ear, lay them on their side, bleeding side down, with a pad under the ear. If the person is bleeding from the nose, apply direct pressure on the soft lower part of the nostril, sit the injured person up, and lean the head forward. Rest and reassure the injured person. Do not make the injuries worse by moving the person unnecessarily. However, there are times when you must move them. Move the casualty only if they are in danger, such as from fire or traffic. Their position makes it impossible to give first aid, or they are unconscious and breathing normally and must be placed in the recovery position. Do not leave the injured person alone unless you are the only person on the scene and need to seek help. If you need to leave an injured person that is unconscious and breathing normally, place them in the recovery position, then seek help. On your return, check airway and breathing and continue to monitor until medical aid arrives. Consider learning first aid to help you in case of an emergency. Visit the St. John Ambulance website for more information, www.stjohnambulance.com.au. Click to Save is a free interactive online first aid course. Go to clicktosave.com.au. This information has been provided by St. John Ambulance, Western Australia, Inc. Emergency Vehicles You can identify an emergency vehicle by its siren or its red and or blue flashing lights. What should you do when there is an emergency vehicle in your immediate vicinity? Do not panic. Check where the emergency vehicle is coming from and give way to it. Move as far as to the left of the road if you can, and if you cannot move left, slow down or stop. Let the emergency vehicle drive around you. It is an offense not to give way to an emergency vehicle. Please do the right thing. Look, listen, and merge left. Contact with electrical infrastructure. A fallen power line or broken street light is extremely dangerous. If you have a car accident involving electrical infrastructure, e.g. a power pole, power line, street light, green dome, etc., Keep yourself and passengers safe by. Following these steps, always assume the power line or electrical infrastructure is live and extremely dangerous. Stay in the car unless you have no choice but to leave, e.g. the car is on fire. Call emergency services on 000 and Western Power on 131351. Remain in the car until help arrives. Tell any witnesses to stay at least 8 meters away from the car and all electrical infrastructure. If you have no choice but to leave the car, e.g. it is on fire, it is crucial you follow these steps to minimize risk of electrocution. Open the car door and prepare to jump in a way that ensures no part of your body touches the car and the ground at the same time. Jump clear from the car landing with your feet together. Either jump with your feet together or use short shuffle steps until you are at least 8 meters away from the car, fallen pole, and or power line. Make the safe call to Western Power's 24-7 emergency line on 131351 as well as calling any other relevant emergency services. Tell any witnesses to stay at least 8 meters away from the car and all electrical infrastructure. A Western Power emergency vehicle will attend the site and ensure it is safe for other emergency services to treat injuries and investigate the scene. Aggressive driving or behavior. Aggressive driving includes the following types of behavior. A person driving alongside you, shouting or making obscene gestures, pointing and demanding that you pull over. Another vehicle following too closely, tailgating you. The driver in front slowing down in an attempt to force you to stop. A driver flashing headlights and or sounding the horn continuously. Or 
A person getting out of a vehicle and approaching you in a threatening manner. Minimizing risk. You can reduce the risk of being confronted by an aggressive driver if you thrive in a courteous manner. Are aware of what is happening around you. Avoid cutting in front of other drivers. Slow down to allow a vehicle to move into your lane. Do not drive too close to the car in front. And keep well clear of a vehicle being driven in an erratic or unsafe way. Protecting yourself. If another driver acts aggressively or abusively, you should. Keep calm and remain in control of your actions. Make sure that all of your windows are up and your doors are locked. Aim to distance yourself from the other vehicle. If another vehicle follows you, drive to the nearest police station or public place where there are people. Record the number plate, color, make, and model of the offending driver's vehicle and remain courteous and tolerant toward the other driver and try to defuse the situation. Reporting aggressive driving or behavior. If you witness or are involved in an aggressive driving incident, call the police as soon as possible on 9222 1111. Modified from information provided by the Royal Automobile Club of WA Incorporated. Part 5. The Law and You. The Western Australian road laws and regulations impose obligations on drivers and penalties on those who commit traffic offenses. To hold a driver's license is not a right, it is a privilege. Your privilege to hold a license may be reviewed if you are convicted of certain traffic offenses, you are involved in a crash, or you have a medical or physical impediment that may affect your ability to ride. It is a serious offense to offer any gift or remuneration, a bribe, in order to obtain a driver's license. Any person who makes such an offer will be liable for prosecution. Change of address or name. Change of address. If you hold a driver's license or have a vehicle licensed in your name and you change your address, you must notify the Department of Transport within 21 days. You can do this by fax 1300-669-995 by post to GPO Box R1290, Perth, Western Australia 6844, or online at www.transport.wa.gov.au slash dbs. When notifying a change of address, please include your driver's license number and plate numbers of all vehicles licensed in your name, including cars, trucks, motorcycles, trailers, and caravans. Also include details of any boat licenses and recreational skippers ticket you hold, your full name, your date of birth, and your current and previous residential address. You will be forwarded a change of address label that should be attached to the back of your driver's license document, card. Please note, firearm license holders must lodge a change of address with WA Police at www.policedwa.gov.au. Change of name. If you hold a Western Australian driver's license or have a vehicle licensed in your name and you change your name, you should notify the DA as soon as practicable. This must be done in person at a driver and vehicle services, DVS, center or DVS agent. Locations of DVS centers are on the inside of the front cover. You will need to provide documentary proof of your previous and current identity. You will need to provide one category A document, Appendix 3, such as your birth certificate and documentary evidence of your new name, such as a marriage certificate or change of name certificate issued by an Australian Registry of Births, Deaths, and Marriages. All documents presented must be original documents. Documents copied and certified as true copies will not be accepted. If you require further information in relation to the documentary evidence required to change your name, please contact DBS on 13 11 56. Traffic Infringement Penalties There are a variety of penalties that can be imposed on drivers who commit traffic offenses. They include fines, license sanctions, such as demerit points and suspension or cancellation, and in some cases imprisonment. Penalties can be Imposed by courts or by infringement notices The penalties imposed by infringement notices are usually much less than can be imposed by a court. Not all traffic offenses are subject to infringement notices. 
However, infringements include fines and sometimes demerit point penalties. Fines are imposed for a range of traffic offenses which are often significant, and certain traffic offenses attract demerit points in addition to fines. You may also be disqualified from driving without incurring demerit points, for example, if you are convicted of a drink or drug-related driving offense, if you offend repeatedly, or if you have a provisional license and are convicted of certain traffic offenses, you will be required to reapply for your license when the disqualification period has finished and may be required to undertake further assessments. Demerit Points Demerit Points Scheme The Demerit Points Scheme is a national program that is currently in place in all Australian jurisdictions. Demerit Points are a form of penalty that may be imposed for a range of driving offenses. The amount of demerit points that are accrued will range dependent on the offense, and if you accumulate too many, it will result in the suspension of your driver's license. Full License Holders Under the provisions of the Road Traffic Authorization to Drive, Act 2008, a person who holds a full license, not a novice driver, who accrues 12 or more demerit points within a three-year period is liable to a disqualification from holding or obtaining a driver's license. Demerit points are always recorded against a person not a driver's license. The recording of demerit points on the demerit point register will always reflect the date the offense was committed, not the date the points were placed on the register. The offense date is important as it determines which demerit points count towards the 12-point limit. The length of the disqualification period is determined by the number of points accrued within the three-year period. If you accumulate more than 12 demerit points in a three-year period, the length of the disqualification period increases, as shown below. Demerit points accrued. Disqualification period. 12 to 15. 3 months. 16 to 19. 4 months. 20 or more. 5 months. If you accrue 12 or more demerit points, you will be disqualified from holding or obtaining a driver's license. Your disqualification period will begin 28 days after the service of an excessive demerit points notice. If you are ineligible or you choose not to elect a good behavior period, see next section, you will be required to surrender your license card at a DVS center or regional DVS agent prior to the disqualification taking effect. Failure to comply with this requirement may render you liable for a penalty. On a double demerit point long weekend or prescribed holiday period, the demerit point slash S attached to many offenses are doubled. Good behavior period. Eligible drivers who have accrued 12 or more demerit points can elect a good behavior period, GBP. To elect a GBP, you must first be served with an excessive demerit points notice, EDPN. By electing the GBP, a person commits to driving for a period of 12 months without committing any further driving offenses. However, if a driver accrues more than one demerit point during the 12-month GBP or if they commit an offense which results in a disqualification period, they will be disqualified for double the original disqualification period. By electing to undertake the GBP, drivers will not be disqualified from driving, which would normally happen when accruing 12 or more demerit points. Although the license holder can continue to drive, for the next 12 months they must not commit any further driving offenses. All Western Australian drivers license holders can elect to undertake the GBP unless they do not hold a current WA driver's license. They hold a provisional driver's license. They are already disqualified. Their license is invalid for any other reason, or their license is under fine suspension. If the fines are paid to clear this suspension within the 21-day election deadline, a driver may elect to drive on GBP. Important Notes The GBP allows a person to continue driving in lieu of serving a mandatory period of disqualification. The GBP is for a 12-month period. Committing a driving offense during the GBP will result in a disqualification period, which is double the original period. Eligible drivers have 21 days after they are served with an EDPN to elect to continue to drive by taking the GBP option. Once the 21 days has lapsed, a driver cannot elect for GBP and 
Persons who have been disqualified from driving for demerit point offenses can no longer apply for an extraordinary license. If a person is currently driving on an extraordinary license and they get a subsequent demerit point disqualification, they can still elect the GBP. However, the GBP will be postponed until the disqualification period related to the grant of the extraordinary license has expired. Graduated Demerit Point System, Novice Drivers a novice driver graduated demerit point system has been introduced, which means all novice drivers are subject to reduced demerit point limits. The demerit point limit applied to novice drivers is dependent on the length of time a person has held a driver's license. See novice driver types below. The novice driver graduated demerit point system was developed to encourage inexperienced drivers to adopt good driving practices. Research shows that infringements and convictions received as a novice driver are good predictors of future crash involvement and that the most effective time to motivate drivers to develop safe driving behaviors is when they first gain a driver's license. Essentially, influencing driver behavior at an early stage of the driving experience will help novice drivers to develop safe driving practices that they will keep with them throughout their driving life. To find out more about the graduated demerit point system, please visit www.transport.wag.gov.au slash dvs. Novice Drivers For the purposes of the Novice Driver Graduated Demerit Point System, a person is a novice driver until they have held a driver's license for a period of two years or periods adding up to two years. This may include a first-time learner's permit holder, the holder of a provisional driver's license, a driver from overseas who has not held a driver's license for at least two years, or the holder of an extraordinary driver's license. Novice Driver Types There are two types of novice drivers. Novice Driver Type 1, for demerit point limit, a person is a novice driver type 1 until they have held a driver's license for a period of one year or periods adding. Up to one year. A novice driver type 1 also includes first-time learners, permit holders, and persons who have never held a driver's license. These drivers will be disqualified from driving for a minimum of three months if they accrue four or more demerit points as a type 1 novice driver. Novice driver type 2, 8 demerit point limit, a person who has held a driver's license for at least one year, but less than two years or periods adding up to two. Years will be disqualified from driving for a minimum of three months if they accrue a total of eight or more demerit points as a Type 2 novice driver. How do I know which limit applies to me? The below table shows when the different demerit point limits apply. If a novice driver exceeds the demerit point limit, they will be disqualified from holding or obtaining a driver's license for a minimum period of three months. Holders of a provisional license will have their license canceled and will need to reapply for a new license once the disqualification period has expired. This may include taking another computerized theory test and practical driving assessment. Holders of a learner's permit will not have their permit canceled, but will still be disqualified for three months. Note, if you are disqualified for exceeding the demerit point limit, you will not be eligible to apply for an extraordinary license and you will not be able to elect the double or nothing option, i.e. drive on a good behavior period. On a double demerit point long weekend or prescribed holiday period, the demerit points attached to many offenses are doubled. This means it will be very easy for a novice driver to exceed the lower demerit point limits and be disqualified. If you are disqualified for exceeding your demerit point limit, you will not be able to lawfully drive at all, even if it is critical for work or study. You can find out how many demerit points you have accrued by ringing the automated demerit point hotline on 1300-720-111 or online at www.transport.wa.gov.au slash dvs. Further information on double demerit point periods can be found at the Road Safety Commission website at www.rsc.wa.gov.au. Regulations for your car. Your car must have the equipment shown of relief. Your car may have a handheld spot lamp or search lamp that may be lit only when the vehicle is stationary. 
The lamp is being used for examining or making adjustments or repairs to the vehicle. The light from the lamp is projected not more than six meters from its source. The vehicle is outside a built-up area, or it is used only for the purpose of reading a road sign. An effective horn, sirens and whistles are not safe and allowed, positive. A clear and clean windscreen made of safety glass with no visual defects. A light that illuminates your rear number plate, steering, rear vision, mirror, or name, and not more than the top 10% tinted. Windscreen wiper and washers. Correctly working rear lights and reflectors. Mudguards in good condition. Door latches that can be worked from the inside and outside. Good brakes that will allow you to stop promptly and hold securely. Safe tires with a tread of at least 1.5 millimeters, as described in part 1.11. Headlights that are properly adjusted and work correctly. If you have a security alarm, it must be of a type that cannot be activated when the car is moving. Regulations for your motorcycle. Your motorcycle must have the equipment shown in the diagram below. Your motorcycle must not have any ornament or fitting that may cause injury in a crash. Any lights, except indicators, shining to the rear that are not red, or any red light showing to the front. Your motorcycle is required to have the following. A red tail light, a stop light, a rear reflector, and a light to illuminate your rear number plate an effective silencer. Indicators, if your motorbike was first licensed on or after January 1st, 1969. Two rear vision mirrors, one on each side. An efficient headlight that works correctly and is properly adjusted. An effective horn, sirens, bells, and whistles are not allowed. Efficient brakes that will allow you to stop promptly. Adequate footrests for both the driver and, if pillion seating exists, for the pillion passenger. Safe tires with a tread of at least 1.5 millimeters, as described in Part 1.11. Regulations for your trailer or caravan. You must not drive a vehicle with an insecure load. Your trailer or caravan must have the correct coupling. At least one safety chain for vehicles up to 2.5 tons gross vehicle mass, ATM, and two safety chains for vehicles between 2.5 and 4.5 tons ATM. The chains must be cross-hitched so that the trailer or caravan will still be secure if the coupling breaks. Rear lights and reflectors. A light that illuminates the rear number plate. Side lights. If the vehicle is more than 2.1 meters wide and a braking system, for example, override brakes, if the gross trailer mass is between 750 kilograms and 2 tons, and a breakaway braking system, if the trailer or caravan is over 2 tons gross trailer mass. Brakes are not required to be fitted if the trailer, caravan, or plant trailer has a gross trailer mass less than 750 kilograms. Ensure your car is fitted with good exterior mirrors so you can clearly see behind you when towing a trailer or caravan. No one is allowed to ride in a semi-trailer, trailer, or caravan while it is being towed unless the trailer has been approved and licensed for the carriage of passengers and is being driven in accordance with any conditions imposed. Towing Limits Towing limits for vehicles are determined by the Road Traffic Vehicles Regulations 2014. Simply stated, the regulations mean that the loaded mass of the trailer you are towing must not exceed whichever is the lesser of the towing capacity of your vehicle's towing apparatus as specified by the component manufacturer or the maximum loaded mass of a trailer that may be towed by your vehicle as specified by the vehicle manufacturer. Where manufacturer's specifications of the vehicle are not known, then the maximum weight that can be towed is either 1.5 times the loaded mass of the vehicle if the trailer has brakes, or if the trailer has no brakes. The weight is limited to the unloaded mass of the vehicle. Towing another vehicle. 
Unless a vehicle is being towed by a licensed recovery vehicle or tow truck, a licensed driver must be in charge of the towed vehicle. If you are towing another vehicle, the space between the two vehicles must be less than 4 meters. If the vehicle being towed is a motorcycle, the space must be 2.5 meters or less. The towing connection must be secure and safe. If the rope, chain, or wire used to tow the vehicle is longer than 2 meters, you must attach a flag or suitable marker to the rope, chain, or wire to ensure that it is clearly visible. The towing capacity approved by the vehicle manufacturer for a particular vehicle and the regulatory towing limits must not be exceeded. You may only tow a vehicle at night if it is equipped with appropriate lighting and the lights are on. The use of a frame trailers require approval from the DOTS Vehicle Safety Branch. Please call 131156 to apply for approval. Horse and Animal Traffic if you are driving a horse-pulled cart at night, you must have the appropriate lights fitted to the vehicle. If you are riding an animal, you are not allowed to lead more than one additional animal. If you are in a motor vehicle, you are not allowed to lead an animal. You must not tie an animal to a motor vehicle to exercise it in any way. You cannot drive cattle or sheep along a road in a town without written permission from the dog. Be courteous when approaching and passing people on horseback. Do not sound your horn or accelerate, as this may frighten the horse. If you see livestock on the road ahead, slow down and be prepared to stop. Part 6. Cycle Safe Cyclists Cyclists have an equal right to use the road as other vehicles. They share the same rights and responsibilities as drivers and motorcyclists. They may legally use the whole lane on roads with lane markings and are allowed to ride two abreast side by side. Share the road with them and allow plenty of room. Bicycles are smaller than other vehicles and people on bicycles can be difficult to see, especially at night, dusk, or dawn. When the speed limit is 60 kilometers per hour or under, motorists must leave a gap of at least 1 m between their vehicle and the bicycle riders when passing. When the speed limit is over 60 kilometers per hour, the gap must be at least 1.5 m. Young riders are particularly unpredictable and you should take extra care when you are sharing the road with a child on a bicycle. People riding bicycles are vulnerable users of our road system and warrant special consideration. Cyclists can reach speeds of over 55 kilometers per hour, so take care not to underestimate the speed of cyclists, especially when they are approaching an intersection or when you are turning across their path. Underestimating a cyclist's speed is one of the most common causes of crashes between motor vehicles and people on bicycles. When you are about to leave your vehicle, check behind you for bicycles. If you cause a crash by opening your door in front of them, you can cause severe injuries and legally you may be to blame. If you are intending to turn left at the next intersection and a person riding a bicycle is riding in front of you, slow down and allow the person to either turn left or go through the intersection ahead of you. Do not cut across in front of a person riding a bicycle. When driving at night, remember that your lights on high beam can dazzle people cycling and walking. Dip your lights when approaching or overtaking a cyclist at night. Do not sound your horn at someone cycling except where necessary for safety reasons. Generally, it startles the rider and may cause the rider to swerve and possibly cause a collision. If a bicycle rider decides to ride on the road when there is a shared path available, give the rider enough clearance. Further information is available below. www.transport.wa.gov.au slash active transport slash active dash transport dot asp www.rsc dot wa dot gov dot au. 108. Cyclists and the Law When riding a bicycle, you're required to abide by all the rules and regulations that govern the drivers of other vehicles. These include traffic control lights, stop, and give way, signs, signals, and keeping to the left, etc. Cycling on footpaths All-age cycling on footpaths is now legal in WA. Please see the frequently asked questions online at www rsc wa gov au slash road dash rules slash browse slash cyclists for further information. The rules and regulations that apply to cyclists only include 
Riders and any passenger in a child carry seat or trailer must wear an approved helmet correctly fastened at all times. Do not ride a bicycle on any portion of a freeway or on a highway that has signs banning cycling, for example, sections of the Row and Tonkin highways. When riding on a shared path, keep to the left and do not ride abreast of another bicycle unless overtaking. When riding on a shared path, give way to pedestrians. Another vehicle or bicycle must not tow your bicycle. When riding a bicycle, you must ride astride a permanent and regular seat attached to the bicycle, and you must have at least one hand on the handlebars, and do not carry, at any one time, more people than the number for which the bicycle is designed and equipped. If a traffic control signal does not change after your bicycle has waited for several minutes, use the pedestrian crossing button to register your presence. This will usually cause the signals to change. When riding at night, your bicycle must have a white front light, visible up to 200 meters ahead, yellow pedal reflectors on both sides of each pedal and two yellow side reflectors on each wheel, an unobstructed red light at the rear, visible up to 200 meters to the rear, and a red reflector that is clearly visible for at least 50 meters from the rear of a bicycle when lit up by a following vehicle's headlights. Cyclist safety wear a helmet. It is compulsory to wear an Australian standards approved helmet. Many serious road injuries and deaths suffered by cyclists are due to head injuries. A correctly fitted, approved helmet will reduce your chances of death or serious injury should you be involved in a crash. Child carrying seat. Any child carrying seat on a bicycle must be securely attached to the frame without sharp edges. It must have guards to prevent fingers and toes being trapped in moving parts. When a child is being carried in a child carrying seat, the rider must be at least 16 years of age. For your own enjoyment and safety, also follow these important points. Make sure your bicycle is correctly equipped. A shared path is a path that is designated by signs for use by both cyclists and pedestrians. Cyclists must keep left and give way to pedestrians on shared paths. When riding at night, wear light-colored clothing. During daylight hours, vivid colored clothing and or helmet can help to attract motorists' attention. Ride your bicycle in a predictable manner. Never change direction without first looking behind and to each side. Use hand signals to let other road users know of. Your intention to change direction and Avoid cycling on roads that carry large volumes of high-speed vehicles unless an appropriate cycle lane or sealed shoulder has been provided. Equipment for your bicycle. Your bicycle must have the equipment shown in the diagram. An efficient rear brake. If fitted with twin brakes, both must be efficient. Two yellow pedal reflectors on each pedal. A red rear reflector. An efficient bell. A white front reflector is required on new bicycles sold at shops. It may soon be required on all bicycles. Two yellow pedal reflectors on each wheel. Part 7. Appendices. Appendix 1. Driver License Authorizations and Eligibility. The Western Australian Driver's License Authorizations and Eligibility Requirements are RN, Moped. You can be granted a driver's license authorizing you to drive RN class vehicles at 16. If you are authorized to drive an RN class vehicle, you may ride any moped. A moped is defined as a motorcycle which has a propelling engine with a capacity not exceeding 50 cubic centimeters and which is designed so as to be capable of a speed not exceeding 50 kilometers per hour. Whether or not it is also capable of being propelled as a pedal cycle, but does not include a power assisted pedal cycle. You can apply for a moped learner's permit at age 15 years and 6 months. RE LMS Approved Motorcycle If you are authorized to drive RE class vehicles, you may ride any motorcycle, with or without a sidecar, that is listed in the publication LMS Approved Motorcycles list published on the Department of Transport website at and condition. LMS Approved Motor Carrier three-wheeled motorcycle or motorized wheelchair designed to be capable of a speed exceeding 10 kilometers per hour. R. Motorcycle. 
Once you have held an RE class license for a minimum period of two years, you will need to make application and pass a practical driving assessment to hold an unrestricted R class license. If you are authorized to drive R class vehicles, you may ride any motorcycle with or without sidecar attachment and any motor carrier, three wheeled motorcycle or motorized wheelchair designed to be capable of a speed exceeding 10 kilometers per hour. See car unrestricted. You can be granted a driver's license authorizing you to drive C-class vehicles at 17. If you are authorized to drive C-class vehicles, you may drive any motor vehicle other than a motorcycle or motor carrier that has a gross vehicle mass, GVM, of 4.5 tons or less. Motor vehicle other than a motorcycle or motor carrier equipped to seat not more than 12 adults, including the driver, and an RN class vehicle, moped, 111,122. CA, car with automatic transmission. You can be granted a driver's license authorizing you to drive CA class vehicles at 17. If you are authorized to drive CA class vehicles, you may drive any motor vehicle with automatic transmission other than a motorcycle or motor carrier that has a gross vehicle mass. GVM of 4.5 tons or less. Motor vehicle with automatic transmission other than a motorcycle or motor carrier equipped to seat not more than 12 adults, including the driver, and an RN class vehicle, moped, LR, light rigid vehicle. To be granted a driver's license authorizing you to drive LR class vehicles, you must have held a license that authorizes you to drive C car class vehicles for at least one year. If you are authorized to drive LR class vehicles, you may drive any motor vehicle other than a motorcycle or motor carrier with a GVM exceeding 4.5 tons, but not exceeding 8 tons. Motor vehicle other than a motorcycle or motor carrier, not exceeding 4.5 tons that is equipped to seat more than 12 adults, including the driver. C. Car, Class Motor Vehicle, and An RN Class Vehicle, Moped, MR, Medium Rigid Vehicle. To be granted a driver's license authorizing you to drive Mr. Class Vehicles, you must have held a license that authorizes you to drive C. Car, Class Vehicles for at least one year. If you are authorized to drive Mr. Class Vehicles, you may drive any motor vehicle other than a motorcycle or motor carrier that has two axles and a GVM exceeding 8 tons. LR, Light Rigid, Class Vehicle, C, Car, Class Vehicle, and an RN Class Vehicle, Moped. And Mr. Class Motor Vehicle may be used to tow one trailer, not a semi-trailer, that has a GVM not exceeding 9 tons and no other trailer. HR, Heavy Rigid Vehicle. To be granted a driver's license authorizing you to drive HR class vehicles, you must have held a license that is not provisional, that authorizes you to drive C car class vehicles for at least two years, or a license that authorizes you to drive LR or Mr. Class vehicles for at least one year. If you are authorized to drive HR class vehicles, you may drive any. Motor vehicle other than a motorcycle or motor carrier that has at least three axles and a GVM exceeding eight tons. MR, medium rigid, class vehicle. LR, light rigid, class vehicle. C, car, class vehicle. And an RN class vehicle, moped. A, HR class motor vehicle may be used to tow one trailer, not a semi-trailer, that has a GVM not exceeding 9 tons and no other trailer. HC, Heavy Combination Vehicle To be granted a driver's license authorizing you to drive HC class vehicles, you must have held a license that is not provisional that authorizes you to drive C car class vehicles for at least three years and a license that authorizes you to drive MR or HR class vehicles for at least one year. If you are authorized to drive HC class vehicles, you may drive any. Motor vehicle other than a motorcycle or motor carrier that is attached to a semi, trailer or trailer that has a GVM exceeding 9 tons. HR, heavy rigid, class vehicle. MR, medium rigid, class vehicle. LR, light rigid, class vehicle. 
C. Car, Class Vehicle, and an RN Class Vehicle, Moped. A. HC Class Motor Vehicle may be used to tow one, but no more than one, trailer in addition to the trailer or semi-trailer if the additional trailer has a GVM not exceeding 9 tons or is an unladen converter dolly or low-loader dolly. MC Multi-Combination Vehicle to be granted a driver's license authorizing you to drive MC class vehicles, you must have held a license that authorizes you to drive a HR or HC class vehicle for at least one year. If you are authorized to drive MC class vehicles, you may drive any heavy combination unit towing one or more additional trailers with a Jeeve M exceeding nine tons. HC, heavy combination, class vehicle. HR, heavy rigid, class vehicle. MR, medium rigid, class vehicle. LR, light rigid, class vehicle. C, car, class vehicle. And an RN class vehicle, moped. Appendix 2, driving in Western Australia whilst holding an interstate or overseas driver's license. Interstate drivers. If you are a visitor to Western Australia with a valid driver's license issued by your home state slash territory, you are not required to obtain a Western Australian, WA, driver's license, unless you have been usually resident in WA for a period exceeding three months. If you are required to obtain a WA driver's license, you may be issued a WA driver's license free of charge. You will not be required to sit a theory test or undertake a practical driving assessment. The new WA driver's license granted will be valid to either the expiry date of your interstate license or up to a maximum of five years. You are only authorized to drive on your interstate license for as long as it remains valid, and you must comply with all conditions endorsed on your license whilst driving in WA. You must carry your license document with you while you are driving and produce that document for inspection at the request of any police officer. Overseas Drivers if you are a visitor to WA with a driver's license issued by your country of residence, you are not required to obtain a WA driver's license. You can drive on the license for as long as it is remains valid. You must carry your license with you while driving and comply with any conditions endorsed on your license document. If your license is written in a language other than English, then your license must be accompanied by an approved translation. An overseas permit to learn to drive is not recognized in WA, so you will not be able to drive on WA roads. The authorization to drive in WA on an overseas license will cease when your overseas license expires or is disqualified. You hold a permanent visa issued under the Migration Act 1958 of the Commonwealth, and you have usually resided in Western Australia for three months. Since the granting of the visa, Applying for a WA driver's license. To apply for AC or R class driver's license in WA, you must be at least 17 years old. Your application process will depend on whether your driver's license was issued in a recognized, experienced driver recognized, or non-recognized country. Certain overseas countries have assessing standards that are recognized by WA and may allow holders of those licenses to be exempt from theory or practical driving assessments when applying for the grant of a WA driver's license. To find out if your license has been issued by a recognized, experienced driver recognized, or non-recognized country, please visit www.transportwa.gov.au slash dvs. Any person applying for the grant of a WA driver's license must produce evidence of their identity and place of residence, Appendix 3. Holders of non-English driver's licenses must produce an approved translation along with their current valid driver license. Translations will only be accepted from the appropriate consulate or accredited translator, advanced translator or advanced translator, senior, Level translators approved by the National Accreditation Authority for Translators and Interpreters Naughty. Note, faxes and photocopies of license documents are not acceptable. Appendix 3. Getting your first license. Proof of identity for your initial application. To uphold DOT's commitment of secure identities for the WA community, you must supply a number of documents as proof of your identity when first applying for a driver's license or photo card. 
a combination of five original documents must be presented to verify your full name, date of birth, and current residential address star. To assist you, there are two options for the combination of documents you must provide. Combination 1. Combination 2. Asterisk note. This may not apply to existing WA photo card, learner's permit, or driver's license holders. Document Guidelines All documents must be originals. Certified photocopies will not be accepted. One of the documents presented must contain your signature, may not be required for WA photo card, and The name on your documents must be the same, or you must provide evidence of change of name that clearly shows the link between your birth name and current name. Original Australian Birth Certificate, not an extract, issued by an Australian Registry of Births, Deaths, and Marriages, RBDM. Commemorative certificates will not be accepted. Australian Citizenship or Naturalization Documentation issued by Department of Home Affairs, DHA, or Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade, DFAT. Australian Visa, supported by an overseas passport. Australian Migration Status, AMS, IMI card issued by DHA. Evidence of Immigration Status, AIS, IMI card issued by DHA. Permanent Residence Evidence, PERI, IMI card issued by DHA prior to July 1, 2017. Residence Determination IMI card, RDI, issued by DHA prior to July 1, 2017. Document for Travel to Australia, DFTTA, issued by the Australian Government. WA Driver's License or Learner's Permit Card that displays the holder's photo and signature. This document must be current or not have expired by more than five years. Australian Driver's License or Learner's Permit Card not issued in WA that displays the holder's photo and signature. This document must be current or not have expired by more than two years and cannot be cancelled, inactive, or refused. Australian passport not expired by more than two years. Overseas passport that is current, expired passports will not be accepted. Consular photo identity card issued by DFT. W photo card. This document must be current or not have expired by more than five years. W photographic firearms identification card. Document of identity issued by DHA. Maritime security identity card cannot be expired. Aviation Security Identification Card cannot be expired. Parental Identification and Statutory Declaration A parent must attend with their child and present their current driver's license for identity verification. Australian FPOS or Credit Card that is current. Australian Bank Statement or Letter, less than six months old. Australian Utilities Account or Notice, such as a gas, water, electricity, or telephone bill, less than six months old. Australian Tax Office Tax File Number Letter, Original, or Tax Notice of Assessment Letter, Original. Official Document or Letter from a Government Agency Showing Residential Address, less than six months old. Residential Tenancy Agreement that is current and shows residential address. Electoral Enrollment Letter Showing Residential Address, Less Than Two Years Old Centrelink or Department of Veteran Affairs Healthcare or Pensioner Concession Card Medicare Card Cannot Be Expired WA Seniors Card WA Vehicle License Registration Paper WA Proof of Age Card Australian Capital Territory Proof of Identity Card New South Wales Photo Card Northern Territory Evidence of Age Card Tasmanian Personal Information Card, Queensland Photo Identification Card, South Australian Proof of Age Card or Victorian Proof of Age Card, Marine License Indicator Card, WorkSafe High Risk Work Card, Dangerous Goods Security Card, Security Guard Slash Crowd Control License, Photographic Police or Australian Defense Force Identification Card, Excludes Civilian Cards, WA Working with Children Card, Australian Key Pass Identity Card WA Recreational Skipper's Ticket Employee Photo Identity Card Issued by State-slash-Territory or Commonwealth Government Australian Defence Force Discharge Papers Less than 12 months old Student Photographic Identification Issued in WA 
school report, certificate of accomplishment or enrollment issued by a secondary school in WA, less than 12 months old. WA Keys for Life Certificate Issued in WA, less than two years old. Australian RBDM Issued Marriage, Divorce or Name Change Certificate. Commemorative certificates will not be accepted. Certificate of Achievement, DL20, issued by an authorized organization. Letter from current employer showing residential address, less than six months old. Written correspondence from a recognized educational institution less than 12 months old. Please note, a document listed in Category B or C containing your current residential address is an acceptable document for Category D, as long as that document has not already been used to satisfy Category B or C. Index. Passive breaking. A. Uh, rigid vehicle. Alcohol and drugs. 5. Blood alcohol concentration, BAC. 5. Effects of alcohol on driving. 5. 8. Legal limit. 6. 7. Random roadside drug and alcohol testing. 9. anti hoon legislation. 2. 18. B. Blind spots 21, 25, 26, 63, 72. Breaks 25, 26, 44, 48, 82, 101, 102, 103, 108. C. Caravan regulations. 103. Car regulations. 100. You wear a helmet. Change of address or name. 95. Changing lanes. 25, 59, 62, 63. 70. Clearways. 74. 77. Country driving. 47. Crashes. Approaching traffic. 2. 11. 12. 31. Main causes. 15. 16. 45. 46. 57. 70. 106. Post-crash management. 79. 86. Crossings. Children's. 19, 20, 56, 71, 74. Pedestrian. 18, 19, 20, 56, 57, 58, 71, 74, 107. Pelican. All on driving. 58. Railway. 48, 49, 74, 83. Water. Legislation. 50. Cushion of space. 24. 43. Cyclists. Regulations. 107. Safety hints. 4. 21. 47. 65. 69. 77. 106. 108. D. Snotty. Demerit points to 22, 34, 86, 96, 97, 98, 99. Driver and Vehicle Service Centers 2, 29, 31, 32, 35, 95. Driver's License Authorization 110. CA, Car with Automatic Transmission, 111. C, Car Unrestricted, 110. HC, Heavy Combination Vehicle, 112. HR, Heavy Rigid Vehicle, 111. LR, Light Rigid Vehicle, 111. MC, Multi Combination Vehicle, 112. MR, Medium Rigid Vehicle, 111. RE, LMS Approved Motorcycle, 110. R, Motorcycle, 110. Driving in different conditions, 45. Country driving, 47. Driving in fog, 47. Night driving, 45, 46. Wet weather driving, 46. Drugs, 5, 6, 8, 9, 17, 29, 33, 80. E. Emergencies. Brake failure. 82. 
Emergency Vehicles 41, 91 Post-Crash Management 86 Tire Blowouts 82 F Fatigue 9, 15, 16, 17, 46 First Aid 87, 91 Following Distances 43 Stopping Times 47, 63 Two second rule. 43. Freeway driving. 63. 64. G. Giveaway rule. Controlled 55, 57, 58, 59, 70. Intersections 19, 20, 48, 56, 66, 69. Uncontrolled 41, 50, 60, 67. Graduated Licensing System 29. I. Indicating and Signaling. Roundabout 61, 62, 66, 67, 68, 72, 73. Types of Indicators and Signals 5, 20, 23, 45, 49, 50, 57, 58, 59, 60, 61. 66, 67, 69, 70, 71, 73, 76, 107, 108. Interstate and International Licenses 113. K. Keep Left Rule 48, 108. L. Learner's Permits. Applications 29, 30, 32, 34. 98. Minimum age 29, 34, 110. M. Mirrors 25, 26, 27, 63, 70, 72, 73, 100, 101, 102, 103. Motorcyclists. Regulations 18, 102. Road Rules 21, 22, 60. Safety Hints 22. N. Night Driving 30, 31, 32, 33, 45, 46, 81, 104, 106. O. Obtaining a License. Graduated Licensing System 29. Learner's Permits 22, 29, 30, 34, 35, 99, 110. Provisional licenses 2, 30, 33, 34, 99. Officer directing traffic. 59. Organ donation. 36, 37. Other road users. 18, 23, 25, 26, 46, 47, 48, 59, 60, 75, 108. P. Parking. Parking signs. 49, 75. Procedures. 76, 77. Prohibited areas. 77. Pedestrian crossing. 18, 19, 56, 107. Pelican Lights, 57, 58. Penalties. Penalties for traffic offenses, 12, 96. Practical Driving Assessments, 2, 30. Aged Assessments, 29, 35. Car Licenses, 30, 31, 32, 113, 114. Motorcycle and Moped Licenses 34. Truck, Articulated Vehicle and Bus Licenses, Classes LR, MR, HR, HC 35. Pre-Driving Checks 26. Brakes 26. Horn 26. Lights 26. Mirrors 26. Steering 58. 26. Tires, 96. 26. 
windscreen and windscreen wipers. 26. Provisional licenses 2, 6, 30, 33, 34, 96, 99. R. Railway crossings 48, 49, 74, 83. Road markings 54, 62, 74, 83. Road rules I, 2, 22, 25, 29, 30, 34, 40, 63. Roundabout 61, 62, 66, 67, 68, 72, 73. S. Safe driving. 25. 98. Seat belts. 10. Who must wear a seat belt? 12. 14. Why you should wear a seat belt? Signs. 11. Guide signs. Ped licenses. 53. Regulatory. 51. Special purpose. 53. Special warning. 52. 73. 77. Speed. 2. Adjusting speed. 3. 17. 23. 25. 42. 43. 45. 52. 63. 64. 65. 66. 68. 70. 72. 73. 82. 85. Speed limits. 2. 3, 4, 31, 40, 41, 48, 53, 63, 64, 71, 72, 73, 106, 110. Stopping. Breaking distances. 44. Reaction time. 5, 8, 23, 44. Road conditions. 4, 41, 44, 85. Stopping distances. 26, 44, 45. T. Trailer regulations. 103. Turning. 68. Multi-lane intersections. 70. Roundabouts. 61, 62, 67. Rules. 19, 20. 21, 25, 48, 50, 54, 58, 59, 60, 66, 67, 68, 69, 71, 72, 73. U-turns. 57, 69. Tires. 96. 26, 44, 85, 101, 102. U. U turns. 57, 69. W. Wet weather driving. 44, 46, 52. Notes.